uh, faculty, and it will be followed by a keynote, uh, uh, I mean, special address by Gopil Acharya from Bhutan, who is a journalist and writer by profession. Then it will be uh, in the third, uh, uh, then we, uh, we have, have uh, Professor Sharif Ati Kuzaman from Bangladesh as our guest speaker. And the later part of the day, we have another 36 more beautiful uh, presenters, uh, presenters across the world. So I'm grateful to uh, many experts, academicians, uh, scholars who have joined us to share their wisdom, knowledge, and also to celebrate literature in this week. I'm sure that you will have a fruitful and rewarding exchanges in this conference. So I look forward to an interesting uh, sessions and debate. So with this, now I would like to request uh, our session chair, Dr. Um, Sayandi to kindly conduct the proceedings of the uh, day. Thank you and Tashidale. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, respected Dean Sir, for this uh, uh, wonderful and warm uh, welcome note. And also thank you for summarizing yesterday's proceedings for those ex especially who, who uh, could not join uh, for the same. So without wasting further time, I would like to uh, take the moment and the pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, uh, Dr. Edward Alexander. And uh, so Dr. Edward Alexander uh, received his PhD in English literature and critical theory from UC Berkeley in 2018. And the very following year, he worked as a lecturer in English literature at the Yon Fula Centenary College, as President Sir Dean Sir Dr. Chitran all mentioned prior to the beginning. Uh, his research focuses primarily on American poetry and on the 20th and 21st century avant-garde. His work has appeared in contemporary literature and the Wallace Stevens Journal. In the fall of 2020, he is teaching in the liberal studies program at the New York University. And today, as his topic says, that he's going to speak on uh, what relevance might recent academic interest in the paranormal have for the study of South Asian literature and folklore? So without wasting um, further time, I would like to request Dr. Alexander to take over and enlighten us. All right. Uh, thank you very much to uh, President Wangdi, uh, Dean Tinley, uh, Madam Chitra, and all the other presenters and conference attendees. It's, it's a great pleasure and honor to be here with you today. Um, is it okay if I share a share slides from my screen? That's, yes? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. And then I just need to figure out full screen. Okay, the, the title of my uh, paper today is, uh, it's actually slightly different from the one I submitted earlier. It's Futures of the Impossible in the Study of the South Asian Imagination. Um, and I have to apologize in advance. Uh, like uh, Professor Bolton, I made the miscalculation in the time schedule. So I was preparing my slides at the very last minute, thinking that I had another day to prepare my slides. So all of the uh, publication info and page numbers are there, but some of the, uh, the formatting, it's not all quite in, in APA formatting, but you will get the, uh, the necessary information you need. So, and I'm going to have to read from my phone so that I can change these slides uh, with the other hand. So I'd like to open with two anecdotes from my wonderful year teaching in the master's program at Yonkola Centenary College. In the first anecdote, a first a student approached me after class one day with a question about his research towards a thesis on Buddhist concepts of reincarnation. Is, can you all hear me okay? The sound is coming through okay. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. Voice is okay, okay, great. 
As a practicing Buddhist with a non-professional interest in academic approaches to Buddhism and religion more generally, I was happy to help. But I was a bit taken aback by his question as to whether I could recommend any scientific sources that demonstrate the truth of reincarnation. I had to admit that none leapt to mind, though this wasn't entirely true, as I'll discuss further on. There was something endearingly earnest about the assumptions motivating the student's question. Buddhist doctrine affirms the existence of past and future lives. Scholarly argumentation depends on evidentiary support in the form of empirical data. Therefore, locating empirical research on reincarnation was an obvious initial first step in the student's research process. Across our respective cultural frames, there was no way that I could communicate to this student my initial impression, indeed my bemusement at the fact that his question struck my ear similarly to being asked for studies demonstrating that good people go to heaven, or to cite a recent headline from the United States, the claim by minister physician Stella Emanuel, whose work Donald Trump cited in a tweet, that medical issues such as ovarian cysts occur when demons have sex with people in their dreams. <laughs> My second anecdote occurred around the same time as the first. I had just arrived at YCC campus from Sheribsey on a Saturday morning to attend an archery match that the second year students were playing. A student approached me where I was sitting and told me that he had just come from visiting Yompula Rinpoche at the Lakhong up the hill. He had approached Yompula Rinpoche to request him to perform a puja in order to dissipate the thick fog that had blanketed the field where the students intended to have their archery match, presumably by placating the Yulha or land deity that resided there. In the student's telling, when he had gone in, the opaque conditions of visibility threatened to ruin their plans. After he left Yompula Rinpoche, who had obliged his request, the fog had entirely cleared. In interpreting this anecdote, one finds two possible worldviews with two overlapping sociocultural attitudes competing with one another for explanatory privilege. Either I could chalk the student's narrative up to the classic logical fallacy of cum hoc ergo propter hoc, with this, therefore, because of this, thereby confusing correlation for causation. This would be worldview number one, which we could call skeptical rationalism. And as a direct consequence, the student becomes a credulous subscriber to primitive cultural belief systems. This is sociocultural attitude number one. Or I could assume an, assume an emic view of, the Buddh of Buddhist skillful means whereby Yompola Rinpoche's merit or punya and refuge in the three jewels invest his beneficent intent to help the YCC students with an ontological primacy over the Yule Law's samsaric condition, affording his ritual actions the efficacy necessary to fulfill the student's request. In this view, the student becomes a voracious empirical witness both to the theoretical truth of Buddhist doctrines of dependent origination and emptiness and to the practical aptness of tantric means. This would be worldview number two, metaphysical agnosticism or perhaps even gnosis. And as a consequence, the student becomes my cultural equal, if not my superior. This would be sociocultural attitude number two or what Bruno Latour has called symmetrical anthropology. My point in delineating these positions and their consequences is not to imply that one is right while the other is wrong. Each one is potentially problematic in its own way, but merely to illustrate the ways in which sociocultural worldviews are bound up in metaphysical ones and vice versa. I suggest this relationship and these cultural and indeed political stakes as my opening statement for a conference on the history and contemporaneity of humanistic study of South Asian culture in order to introduce the paper's broader claim that humanist scholars of South Asian culture have an interest in taking seriously the contemporary renewal of Western academic interest in metaphysics, consciousness studies, and research into what, for lack of a better term, we would call the paranormal. In what follows, I will outline some of the broad parameters of this tendency by, re by rehearsing some of the key ideas and claims of its associated figures. This initial discussion will lead me toward an even stranger subject matter which may in fact already be familiar to some of you, namely the literature and reception history of the visionary tradition within the Nyingma lineage of Vajrayana Buddhism 
associated with terma or treasure teachings and tertans or treasure revealers. Tantric saints whose claims to paranormal abilities, though contested both within and beyond their own traditions, have historically proven foundational to the natural, national cultural traditions of the Himalayan regions. Contemporary academic study of the paranormal affords us new avenues with which to approach this tradition, so central to Bhutanese cultural history on its own terms, while revising previous, always politically charged treatments, framing these traditions illegitimacy as a foregone conclusion. Part one, the occulted history of the paranormal within the development of the modern episteme. In a 2018 issue of American Psychologist, the flagship publication of the American Psychological Association, home of the beloved APA citational format, Etzel Cardenia published a peer-reviewed article entitled The Experimental Evidence for Parapsychological Phenomena, a review. In the article, Cardenia reviews recent experimental research in the domain of psi phenomena, including categories of ESP, such as telepathy, being affected by someone else's thoughts, clairvoyance or remote viewing, the ability to gather information about physically remote locations, and precognition, the ability to gain information about future states of affairs as well as PK, short for psychokinesis, the putative direct action of mental events on physical objects. Cardenia's study concludes that meta-analysis of findings within the field of psi research provides cumulative support for the reality of psi, which cannot be readily explained away by the quality of the studies, fraud, selective reporting, experimental or analytical incompetence, or other frequent criticisms. Cardenia's conclusion from the data that the evidence for psi is comparable to that for established phenomena in psychology and other disciplines, inevitably found its skeptical detractors who base their criticism on the grounds of the evidence's a priori inadmissibility. In 2019, Arthur Raber and James Alcock published a critique of the piece in Skeptical Inquirer, whose central thesis is expressed in the title, Why Parapsychological Claims Cannot Be True. Psy research in Raber and Alcock's view, quote, is bankrupt and has been from the beginning because its findings violate fundamental principles of science and hence can have no ontological status. Both Cardenia's unprecedented publication and Raber and Alcock's a prioristic critique, in fact, had precedents. To cite just one, in 2017, an article in Slate Magazine on Cornell University psychologist Daryl Bem's 2010 article in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, which the author noted turns away 85% of its submissions, publishing the results of a 10-year study strongly suggestive of the reality of ESP, played out the logic of this dialogue in its title as well. Daryl Bem proved that ESP is real, which means science is broken. The logic here is fundamentally the same as Raber and Alcock's petition. Because we already know that these things can't happen, therefore they didn't. Rather than ask what Bem's findings might suggest about the hegemony of naturalism and physicalism as worldviews, Daniel Engberg turns instead to question the scientific apparatus and methodology as such. In other words, Engberg's logic is if valid scientific method can prove this true, then it can prove anything true. Rice University scholar of religions, Jeffrey Kripal, whose recent work has spearheaded a broader turn towards scholarly consideration of topics formerly and as the previous examples show, in many cases still regarded as taboo, neat, neatly encapsulated this blend of the normative and the epistemic in the interdiction on scientific evidence that transgresses the dictates of the materialist worldview in 2010's Authors of the Impossible, the Paranormal and the Sacred. Kripal makes the case that the marginalized scientific subfield of parapsychology, whose contemporary roots can be traced to the founding of the Society for Psychical Research in England in 1882 and J.B. Ryan's founding of the Duke University Parapsychology Labs in 1935, constitutes a disciplinary reframing of an older epistemic, phenomenological, and sociological category namely that of the sacred, in the strict sense derived from Rudolf Otto's idea of the numinous in 1917's The Idea of the Holy. The paranormal in Kripal's account is the sacred in transit from a traditional religious register into a modern scientific one. 
This transit is important to my account for several reasons, least controversially because of how it frames what philosopher Charles Taylor has called the subtraction narrative of secularization within Western societies. Like Taylor's critique of the subtraction narrative, the myth within popular imagination that the historical development of Western societies entailed scientific rationality's supplanting of religion, Kripal's account of the sacred's transit from religious institutions into repressed, but as the Bem and Cardinia examples show, persistently resurgent domains of scientific inquiry challenges easy triumphalist narratives about the march of rational progress. Recent work in the field of science and technology studies has demystified many popular social imaginaries about the relationship between experimental science as a socially embedded practice and the historical development of authoritative epistemological models of reality. Among these studies, a number of historians have produced revisionist accounts of the role religion, magic, occultism, and psi phenomena played during and after the scientific revolution. To name just a few, historian William R. Newman has produced a number of works studying the longstanding interest in alchemy among Sir Isaac Newton, George Starkey, Robert Boyle, and other members of the group centered around polymath and intelligencer Samuel Hartlip that would give rise to the Royal Society. Robert Noakes' Physics and Psychics examines the relationship between Victorian physical sciences and, this, and psychical research. Exploring these overlapping interests in the work of physicists like Oliver Lodge and other scientists of the period, whose ranks included four Nobel laureates, three presidents of the Royal Society, and three presidents of the British Association. Jason Josephson Storm's The Myth of Disenchantment interrogates Max Weber's concept of disenchantment by recovering the dalliances with magic among professed rationalists, extending from Francis Bacon to Walter Benjamin and Weber himself. Both Kripal and Diana Walsh Pasulka have studied the military funded research into remote viewing, a technical term for ESP conducted at the Stanford Research Institute in the 1970s. The overall picture that emerges from these revisionist accounts is not a subtraction of enchantment under the cold clinical gaze of sober rationality, but a complex and ongoing entanglement of socially embedded practices sorting out the ever shifting boundaries between the mental and the physical through various experimental means. In many ways, at the core of what lends these uh, at the core of what lends these contemporary revisionist approaches credence is the persistent ambiguity around the so-called double slit experiment of quantum mechanics. In illustrating quantum entities display of the mutually exclusive physical properties of wave or particle as seemingly dependent on the act of human measurement, this famous experiment inevitably included among its many competing interpretations the possibility that the observer or consciousness plays some essential role in the constitution of material reality. Though the Copenhagen interpretation of Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg has perhaps fallen from the prestige it enjoyed for most of the 20th century, the double slit experiment that Richard Feynman called the heart of quantum mechanics nevertheless exploded the 19th century mechanistic worldview by presenting in Feynman's account a phenomenon which, it, it, which is impossible to explain in any classical way whose implications continue to reverberate in debates about mind's relationship to nature. Cardenia, for example, draws upon the work of physicists Daniel Sheehan, Freeman Dyson, and Bernard Carr to show how findings in quantum physics challenge common sense notions of mind, time, space, and causality in ways that render psi phenomena pl plausible within a contemporary scientific worldview. As Kripal puts it, it would do us well to remember that which we have forgotten in order to understand that the possible can be construed quite otherwise than it is at the moment. That that which is impossible can become possible. Kripal's most recent book, The Flip, Epiphanies of Mind and the Future of Knowledge, brings into the foreground this core question of consciousness's place and status within a broader theoretical picture of objectivity. Marshalling a host of conversion narratives featuring professed materialists with professional training in the physical sciences, including inventor of the EEG, Hans Berger, logical positivist philosopher, A.J. Ayer, investigative journalist with a PhD in cellular immunology, Barbara Ehrenreich, 
neuroscientist Marjorie Woolacott and others, Kripal shows how these scientists underwent personal experiences that flipped them from a materialistic worldview that treats consciousness as an epiphenomenon reducible to material states in the brain to one in which consciousness is seen as a fundamental irreducible feature of the world. However numerous these cases, and I apologize if I somewhat replicate Kripal's rhetorical strategy of piling up examples, the overall approach remains anecdotal, rooted in personal testimony rather than reasoned argumentation and experimental proof. While the sheer volume of credible testimony deserves consideration, it is not sufficient to make the case for consciousness's irreducible, irreducibility on its own merit. Fortunately, the history of scientific, beyond the history of scientific inquiry and the challenge quantum physics poses to the classical Newtonian picture, there is yet another tendency within contemporary intellectual life that has contributed to the growing reassessment of reductionist materialist accounts of consciousness. Within contemporary debates in the field of philosophy of mind, a number of challenges have been posed to physicalism as a plausible account of consciousness. Physicalism is the philosophical con condition that all consciousness derives from material states. The most famous of these is David Chalmers' notion of the hard problem of consciousness. Chalmers' hard problem poses the following question. Even if we can solve the easy problem of consciousness by providing exact correlations between experiential states and material neurophysiological processes, the deeper question remains of why in a presumably material universe, conscious states or qualia should exist at all. In other words, in a pur purely materialist picture of the universe, conscious states are a pure redundancy without any functional purpose. A materialist description of the universe is perfectly conceivable in which conscious experience never enters into the picture. And yet we are faced with the constant fact of qualia as our most immediate knowledge of the world. Thomas Nagel's 2012 book, Mind and Cosmos, why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false, gave a teleological inflection to Chalmers articulation of the hard problem by arguing that current evolutionary explanations of the emergence of consciousness purely through the mechanisms of random mutation and natural selection are inadequate to account for the fact and complexity of qualitative conscious experience. While Nagel's book suffered scathing criticism from cognitive scientists such as Steven Pinker and philosophers like Daniel Dennett, his own critique of physicalist treatments of consciousness have been seconded by anti-reductionist philosophers of mind such as Galen Strawson, Philip Goff and Bernardo Castro. Works like Chalmers and Nagel's, though controversial, have contributed to the increasing respectability of philosophical positions such as panpsychism, the view that all material processes from brain states to subatomic particles entail conscious correlates, neutral monism, the view that matter and consciousness are derivations of a prior state irreducible to either of these determinations, and metaphysical idealism, the view that consciousness is ontologically primary within philosophy of mind in the last decade or so. To recap, a number of developments within contemporary intellectual culture have lent plausibility to the fields of parapsychology and psi research as evidenced by such high profile scholarly publications as Cardenia's and Bem's incredible scholarly journals. The first of these tendencies that I explored has been the emergence of science and technology studies with its associated historical revisionism. Recent historians have shown how the experimental sciences not only emerged from contexts in which they were entangled with natural philosophy, magic, alchemy, hermetism, psychical research, and other esoteric traditions, but have remained entangled in these traditions or their offshoots and progeny, albeit in ways that have often remained occulted, disavowed, or concealed due to scientists' wish to avoid social or professional ridicule. The second development has been the challenge that quantum physics in general and the double slit experiment in particular has posed to the classical Newtonian picture of a clockwork-like material universe governed by me mechanistic laws and the question these raise about co the conscious observer's role in the constitution of empirical objectivity. A number of physicists working within this field or the associated though competing field of general relativity from Bohr and Heisenberg to David Bohm, Herwing Schrodinger and Wolfgang Pauli 
have advocated for worldviews treating mind as a fundamental feature of reality. Lastly, challenges to physicalist accounts of consciousness within philosophy of mind, such as the work of Chalmers, Nagel, Strawson, and many others, have thrown into question the view of consciousness as an epiphenomenon of material processes within the brain on more purely conceptual grounds. Humanist scholars like Kripal, meanwhile, have taken the pulse of these developments and begun elaborating their consequences for the humanities, which since the mid to late 20th century have taken their cue from social scientific methodologies such as structuralism and post-structuralism, theoretical positions often presupposing the reductionist orthodoxies accompanying popularization of the natural sciences. If anything has become clear in the last decade or so, it is that these reductionist orthodoxies, that culture, mind, and meaning are merely superstructural symptoms of a meaningless, blind, material base, warrant examination. In the following section, I will begin to explore some of the consequences such new ways of thinking might have for the study of traditional Bhutanese culture. An essential claim within Kripal's project, borne out in part by recent sociologically minded accounts of the natural sciences historical development, is that meaning and matter have insistently remained mutually constitutive processes within the entangled practices and institutions that birth the so-called modern worldview. Speaking to the ways the division of labor and the distribution of the sensible and intelligible mutually implicate one another, Kripal argues that paranormal phenomena dramatically violate those firm epistemologically bound, epistemological boundaries that, since Descartes, have increasingly divided up our university departments and our social reality into things pertaining to matter and objective reality, the sciences, and things pertaining to human experience and subjective reality, the humanities. As such, they appear in the space where the humanities and sciences meet beyond both where mind and matter, subjectivity and objectivity merge in ways that can only violate and offend our present order of knowledge and possibility. In the example of one profoundly paranormal phenomenon, the Vajrayana Buddhist treasure, tradition, treasure literature of Bhutan, we find an exemplary case of the ways such epistemic violations can, paradoxically, prove foundational for the sovereignty of national cultures. Part two of burning lakes and one-eyed goddesses, approaching the visionary traditions of the Himalayan regions. To approach the phenomenon of revealed treasures, or terma, through the avenues recent scholarship opens to us, Kripal's definition of the paranormal as the sacred in transit from a traditional religious to a scientific register proves a useful point of departure. As we have already seen, the historical movement subtending this transit can be thought of as a subtraction of mind's superstitious delusions from the brute realities of a material and historical, historical substrate only in the most ideologically caricatured and distorting sense. In reality, we find that this transit has consisted in a complex series of local negotiations between individuals, groups, institutions, social norms, categories of knowledge and practices in which particular contingent and ever-changing distributions of the sensible the intelligible and the real have been forged. In one such pivotal local event, Rene Descartes conceived of a future unification of all fields of knowledge and elaborated the methodology towards such a unification in his discourse on the method of properly guiding the reason in the search of truth in the sciences. The first tenet of Descartes' method, the famous Cartesian doubt that would yield the cogito or philo philosophical dictum, I think, therefore I am, that would split reality into the two separate domains of subjective res cogitans or cognized things and objective res extensa or extended things. Cartesian doubt and the cogito are thus often placed at the origin of the division of intellectual labor on which the separation between the humanities and sciences has been built. Less frequently remarked in this well-known historical episode is that Descartes' quest for epistemological certainty began with a series of dream visions occurring on the night of November 10th, 1619. In the three dreams, Descartes believed that he had been visited by a series of disincarnate entities and, and symbolic omens, a ghost that he took to be a bad genie in the first dream, a sharp thunderous explosion in the second, and a strange man who handed him a book beginning est a non, what is and is not, in the third dream. 
Believing his dream visions to have been divinely inspired, Descartes would begin the research process that culminated in the seminal Discourse on Method. What is so striking about this backstory of the founder of modern epistemology is its resemblance to the origin stories that have imbued Vajrayana treasure literature with such a dubious status to its critics. A dream or trance vision in which the tertan or treasure revealer receives a kind of download of transformative spiritual knowledge from a disincarnate entity, often a Yidam deity, celestial Buddha or Dakini, and often in the form of a symbolic object such as a book, text or statue. Indeed, as we shall see, the entire institution and tradition of revealed treasures rests upon the Tertan status as a conduit for these visions. The Tertan acts as a kind of transcendental interface or receiver linking the present social milieu to both an historical past in the origins of the Nyingma lineage during the semi-mythical Saint Padmasambhava's visit to Tibet under the 8th century Yarlung dynasty and to a purely metaphysical visionary realm. This mutual dependence of secular and sacred genealogies within the tradition of revealed treasures has provided ample material for skeptical debunkings of the tradition, both within and beyond Buddhism, on the grounds that re the revealed treasures ultimately function as a legitimation of particular monastic and dynastic orders for purely political ends. Indeed, treasure literature's emergence contemporaneously with the Sarma or new translation schools of the 11th century when new tantric teachings began to be imported from India to Tibet has tended to support the view that revealed treasures ultimately serve to ensure the authenticity of the Nyingma lineage in the face of competing models of scriptural authority represented in the Kagyu, Sakya, and Gelug lineages. My interest today is less in challenging these explanations, which along with critiques of panpsychism and metaphysical idealism in Western contexts, constitute a pervasive strain of reductionist accounts that will continue to find a large number of adherents. Then, in, then, in, then I am in exploring the ways in which the visionary and historical provenance of treasure teachings become intelligible and plausible in light of Kripal's claim that any ordinary history of religions that relies exclusively on textual, critical, social scientific, or political analyses from Foucauldian constructivism and post-colonial theory to philology and materialist cognitive science is woefully inadequate to the task of understanding and interpreting the paranormal. One such famous reductionist account of Tertan and Bhutanese cultural hero, Pema Lingpa, uh, the life story of Pema Lingpa, Michael Eris's Hidden Treasures and Secret Lives relies on a combination of philology, conjecture, and insinuation to paint Pema Lingpa as a shrewd performance artist and con man managing the credulity of his audiences to gain cultural capital in a feat of pseudo paranormal real politic. From the beginning of his account, Eris relegates Pema Lingpa's story to the literary, literary realm in ways that will ultimately matter for my present aims. Describing traditional, the traditional account of Pema Lingpa's discoveries as Tolkien-esque, in reference to the author of the fantasy series, Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien. Citing chronological discrepancies in Pema Lingpa's autobiography, along with skeptical critiques of Pema Lingpa from within the Buddhist tradition, Eris ultimately conflates these latter critiques with a rhetorical appeal to the sober objectivity of the rationalist worldview. If Pema Lingpa's contemporaries, along with brilliant skeptic Drippa Kunle, not to mention the reformed Gelukpa school, were capable of holding the view that he was basically a fraud, then surely rational and critical scholars of the 20th century can do so too. As Andreas Doctor points out, however, Eris refrains from explaining the connection he perceives between, the skeptical, ra between skeptical rationalism, the judgment of the well-known eccentric and enlightened madman, Drupal Kunle, and the notoriously anti-Nyingma Gelukpa school, in Doctor's view, it seems clearer that Eris has appropriated a politicized Tibetan agenda to argue a personal conviction that has not otherwise been convincingly established. Eris's conflation of multiple, in some sense, incompatible modes of skepticism is significant for the methodological questions I am trying to examine here. Many critiques of, the tre of treasure literature originating within the Vajrayana Buddhist tradition base themselves not on a rejection of visionary experience per se, 
but rather on the exact visionary provenance of such experiences. While Doctor observes that questions of authenticity arose almost immediately upon the first revelations of treasure, such questions pertain to competing explanations of the teachings transpersonal origins rather than their categorical fraudulence. The basic origin story of treasure teachings begins during Padmasambhava's sojourn in Tibet under the auspices of King Trisong Detsen in the eighth century, when the former clairvoyantly anticipated the future degeneration of Tantric Buddhism. Concealing a number of teachings within various physical locations throughout the Himalayan region, including rocks, bodies of water, even the sky, Padmasambhava is held to have placed these teachings under the protection of various disincarnate beings, such as Dharmapalas and Dakinis, and appointed particular times and circumstances for their future recovery. Central to the auspicious circumstances of their recovery, Padmasambhava appointed subsequent incarnations of particular disciples within the court of Trisong Detson to the future role of treasure revealer, thereby establishing the simultaneously metaphysical and socio-historical genealogy of Tertans. Pema Lingpa, for example, is said to have previously incarnated as Princess Pemasal, the daughter of Kris Trisong Detsen and Queen Droza Changchup, who received a number of teachings and tantric initiations directly from Padmasambhava before reincarnating as the famous Nyingma saint Longchen Rabjam in the 14th century. But along with this historically chronological or, or horizontal provenance, the, his, the treasure tradition also formulates a, what I would call a vertical provenance in which the teachings devolve onto the human and material plane from various purely intelligible immaterial dimensions of reality. The tradition represents this process in terms of three transmission lineages, the realization lineage of the conquerors, the symbolic lineage of the Vidyadharas and the hearing lineage of ordinary people. The teachings originate as purely mental or intelligible states of consciousness transmitted directly from the mind of a particular Buddha to a disincarnate disciple within the Dharmakaya or truth body realm. They are transmitted by means of symbolic or semiotic visions associated with the Sambhogakaya or enjoyment body realm. And lastly, they are orally transmitted through the Nirmanakaya or manifestation body realm, which verges on quotidian reality. These three stages of transmission are in a sense superimposed on the historical genealogy treated as occurring simultaneously with each of the sequential stages of historical transmission. Thus, Longchenpa explains that the three final stages of empowerment, by, of empowerment by aspiration, prediction of the transmission, and entrustment to the Dakinis occurring between Padmasambhava and his original disciples ostensibly on the Nirmanakaya, Nirmanakaya plane of physical historical manifestation also unfold within the visionary semiotic plane of the symbolic lineage of the Vidyadharas, which itself derives from the original Dharmakaya translation of the realization lineage. As Holly Gailey argues, the transmission process special to the treasure tradition, this, this final three stages occurring between Padmasambhava and his disciples, in a sense reiterates the original journey of a set of teachings through mental, symbolic, and verbal media. During the empowerment ceremony, Padmasambhava is said to implant the treasure in the mind stream of a disciple appointed as the one destined to reveal it. According to the third Dudrucha Jigme Tempe, uh, Tempe Nima, the mind is the true place of the treasure's concealment and the physical treasure is the symbolic means to spark its recollection. The process thus braids together the physical, symbolic, and mental in a manner that links both chronological historical time to various visionary planes. So central to Kripal's account of the ways consciousness both occludes or hides itself in material and symbolic forms and allows itself to be seen as if in a mirror so that it can be shaped into definite but always relative forms in paranormal events, epistemological violation, this blurring of the boundaries between consciousness and matter plays out in the different categories of treasure revelations as well. The two primary categories of gong ter or mind treasures, which appear as purely mental experiences and seter or earth treasures, which are retrieved as physical objects from physical location, often in ways that defy materialist explanation and that the tradition documents as frequently witnessed by large groups similarly display the confounding of the Cartesian mental-physical binary 
that Kripal treats as a hallmark of the paranormal. Perhaps as a result of the general consensus around the existence of these events within the Vajrayana Buddhist tradition, the emic critiques Eris invokes and places in service of his own edict critique were often based on, on the premise that the extraordinary circumstances seemingly associated with treasure revelation were actually the result of non-Buddhist disincarnate forces such as gods and demons. Eris's conflation of etic and emic or metaphysical and epistemological grounds for the critique of Pema Lingpa and other Tertans obscures a fundamental condition of the tradition's intelligibility as such. Namely, the view that questions of paranormal authenticity can only be sorted out on equally paranormal grounds. Mipam Rinpoche's treatise on treasure literature, Gem That Clears the Waters, expresses this logic in its concluding assertion that it is best to resolve your hesitation in the presence of a powerful, i.e. spiritually accomplished person. Such an internal logic informs what is probably the most famous episode in Pema Lingpa's life story. The event of, this event occurred in Karma Puncho's account, partly in order to establish the authenticity of his first discovery against charges that he was either one, a fraud, or two, possessed by evil spirits. After Pema Lingpa had, had recovered a first treasure, the quintessence of the secrets of clear expanse, in a state of trance from the riverine pool below the cliff of Naringdra on a full moon night in 1476. In a spectacular act witnessed by a huge crowd, Pema Lingpa plunged into the deep pool with a butter lamp in his hand, swearing the oath, if I am an emanation of a devil, may I die within this river. If I am a heart son of Guru Padmasambhava, may I return with the required treasure and not even this lamp be extinguished. He emerged from the pool with a staff. In this account of the event of which Nebuchadnezzar of the Burnt Lake of the Bumtang region derived its name, Pema Lungpa's thaumaturgical act responds to doubts cast regarding his previous improbable act with another equally improbable act. A 19th century hagiographical account of Pema Lingpa's prior discovery written by Kunzang Dechen Dorje is even more fantastical than the Maybartso retrieval, despite its resemblance in certain respects to Descartes' dream vision. When Pema Lingpa arrived at the river's edge, immediately an intense experience of having lost all dwelling bearings welled up in him, and he took off his clothes and jumped in the water. Beneath the water, in a place called Palgi Pukring, the glorious long cave, there was a life-size figure of the teacher. To the left side of this was a stack of many rhinoceros skin chests. A woman with one eye wearing maroon clothes handed him a treasure box from among these containing the text of the quintessence of the mysteries of the luminous space of Samantabhadri. After somehow being propelled back onto the cliff, he returned with his friends at midnight. He blessed his mother, father, and others with the treasure. Such accounts seem to strain plausibility. In short, they seem impossible, leaving us unsurprised at the incredulity of Pemalingpa's various audiences. As Eris's Tolkien-esque epithet implies, these anecdotal accounts most strongly resemble fictional, mythological, and imaginative lore rather than descriptions of fact. This resemblance to narratives primarily derived from folklore and literature is not accidental, though perhaps not in the ways one might expect. To explain why, I need first to account for how recent scientific work on the paranormal makes accounts such as the previous ones broadly intelligible. First, a comparison. The chemist Kerry Mullis, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1993 for his invention of the polymerase chain reaction or PCR technique through which DNA is reproduced from a small sample, records an equally strange experience in his autobiography. While at a cabin in Northern California in 1985, he reports walking outside and encountering a glowing raccoon that greeted him, hello doctor, Mullis reports that his next memory is of walking up a hill early the next morning, having lost several hours that he was unable to account for. Kripal cites this story as an example of the mind-boggling strangeness of many reported paranormal experiences. The point is not that we are meant to subscribe to a belief in the physical reality of one-eyed, subaqueous women, 
or glowing, well-mannered, talking raccoons. But neither, in Kripal's account, do pathologizing explanations that would uh, reduce all such experiences to mere hallucination account for their anomalous qualities. Most psi phenomena, by definition, depend on external verification of one form or another, such as SRI, Stanford Research Institute, remote viewer Pat Price's drawing of a Soviet military location, which United States intelligence agents later verified through aerial photography. Mullis's daughter likewise reports being missing for three hours while her fiance searched for her around the time of her father's experience. Within the Himalayan tradition, we find the frequent avowals of earth treasure revelations taken from solid rock faces by eyewitnesses. The solution instead, instead seems to lie in the fallibility of the residual Newtonian and Cartesian assumptions that color our picture of the world. The models developed within the philosophical doctrine of neutral monism, elaborated by the physicist David Bohm and in the Eunice Mundus theory, the psychoanalyst Carl Jung developed in collaboration with quantum physicist Wolfgang Kaufmann, present consciousness of matter as divergent but ultimately unified expression of the underlying reality that includes but transcends both categories. Bohm attempted to reconcile quantum phenomena with general relativity by dividing reality into what he calls an implicate and explicate order. The explicate order consists of everyday conscious experience of physical objects in space and time and unfolds out of an unfolded pre-spatio-temporal implicate order in which consciousness and matter have not yet been differentiated. Similarly, Jung and Pauli postulated a substrate inclusive of both consciousness and matter in Jung's effort to develop a theoretical model capable of explaining the observed phenomena of synchronicities, seemingly meaningful coincidences of subjective phenomena and events in the world that the Buddhist tradition associates with the idea of auspicious coincidence. In such accounts, the Newtonian world itself is a kind of projected appearance or hologram arising simultaneously with perceiving consciousness. Just as in the Yogacara theory, subject and object arise as positions within the thoroughly afflicted nature, whose ontological status, the underlying imaginary or dependent nature negates as empty of inherent existence. In all of these models, the imprecation of mind and matter frames such anomalous experiences in which I can know distant events of others' experiences, solid matter becomes permeable, or I experience bizarre, non-human, sometimes non-corporeal entities as broadly intelligible examples of consciousness, at least semi-constitutive relation to the world. Just as, but just as Kripal argues that interpretation requires a kind of double hermeneutic that simultaneously seeks to retrieve and recuperate veridical content of these, from these experience, experiences and to bracket the ultimate truth value of the particular cultural and symbolic forms in which these experiences clothe themselves at religious events. So too we can sustain a consideration of the reported phenomenological dimensions to Pema Lingpa's or Kerry Mullis's experiences without necessarily assigning a final ontological status to one-eyed dakinis or well-mannered talking raccoons. To do so is to honor the porousness of mind and world around which accounts of sacred and paranormal experiences converge. Ultimately, the computer screens on which we communicate are no less socially constructed imagined projections of an underlying substrate whose final ecological status remains in question than Pema Lingpa's experiences or the social group's experiences of Pema Lingpa. The truth is left unchanged by our rejecting or inquiring into these experiences. What change are the conditions of the hermeneutic process. It is the centrality of the imagination and the aesthetic interpretive faculty at the interface of mind and world, a centrality doctrinally established in the notion of the imaginal semiotic spheres of the Sambhogakaya of, of Vajrayana and the dependent nature of Yogacara that makes these into foundational questions for humanist scholars for whom aesthetic experience and hermeneutics are stock and trade. Kripal argues that although paranormal phenomena certainly involve material processes, they are finally organized around signs and meaning. The historian of religion Mirtia Iliadi seems to have been speaking to a similar insight 
when he advocated for treating folklore as an instrument of knowledge. In other words, from the perspective that the category of the sacred derives from experiences that in modern parlance we would call paranormal, the spectrum of folklore, myth, and religious institutions, while undoubtedly deployed and appropriated for various social, cultural, and political projects, is ultimately comprised of sedimented forms of what Kripal calls consciousness encoded within culture. The hermeneutic process then requires sifting the layers of cultural overlay, hagiographical hey, genre conventions, factional pol politics entrenched as dogma and rhetoric and so on, not in order to demystify the truly extraordinary dimensions of human experience to which these traditions bear witness as irreducible to historical and material determinants, but rather to retrieve those extraordinary dimensions. Pema Lingpa's enshrinement as a cultural hero played an important role in the formation of a distinctly Bhutanese cultural identity with the unification of Bhutan under Jabdrung Nawang Namgyal in the 1630s, as evidenced in Pema Lingpa's enduring cultural status after the establishment of the Drukpa Kagyu lineage as Bhutan's official state religion. In another example of the way South Asian culture has preserved these traditions that ultimately can serve, if we entertain my reading, as profound repositories of up-to-date knowledge of human consciousness in all its capacities, Kripal claims that his approach to these questions originated in the Shaktipat experience he underwent in Bengal while conducting fieldwork towards his dissertation for the University of Chicago on the tantric Saint Ramakrishna. By excising the paranormal dimension of these experiences from the historical archives, we can only be left with Saidian Orientalism as the exclusive interpretive frame with which to approach the long history of interactions between Westerners and South Asian religious, mythic, and folkloric traditions. To return to the second anecdote with which I began, such an inclusive hermeneutic allows me to take my students' testimony of Yampula Rinpoche's extraordinary means at face value, while also affording an understanding of the cultural overlays that mediate this testimony. As for my other student, I eventually informed him of Ian Stevenson's work documenting cases of reincarnation uh, at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, continued to this day in the, in the UVA's Division of Perceptual Studies. I can only hope that student will continue his research in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Alexander, for this really a fascinating set of reflections. And uh, I mean, it was an amazing journey, uh, I must say, and I'm sure it's with the listeners. Uh, so many dimensions, paranormality, uh, folklore, uh, psychological aspects, uh, then the Descartian cartography, placing them on the same platform and engaging and you know, making it interactive with each other. Uh, while the participants, uh, they, they think and they feel like putting in the questions in the chat box, I was wondering to start the discussion uh, with a question of mine, which is actually, I'm like, this question is out of a curiosity. I'm very curious to know. So uh, obviously uh, this question is about the connection between paranormality, uh, folklore, and also its, its spiritual representation. Now, usually, uh, if we look into the various indigenous communities across the world, and I am specifically talking about uh, non-white indigenous communities across the world, we see that uh, the concept of spirit, which we often uh, you know, speak as a ghost, we really loosely say it's a ghost, right? That concept of spirit is very... Uh, has a very uh, rich entity amongst the indigenous communities. On many occasions, we see that it is not exactly an object to create fear amongst the people. It's an object of worship. It's an object of regular existence. There are many indigenous communities who, in a very usual, normal manner, believe that, yes, there are certain spiritual elements that exist beyond our vision and they exist around us, we coexist with each other, and that's a very nice thing. But usually, dominantly in the West, what we see, if we say, if I be very specific with the term West, mostly in Europe and the United States, we see this concept of 
this concept of spirit, this concept of paranormality, as we see being represented through different media like the movies, uh, through articles, through television, uh, soap operas or whatever, whether it's fictionally portrayed or realistically portrayed, whatever it is, it is shown in a very, uh, you know, in a, in a very fearful form. So obviously if I watch those, I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to feel that, okay, paranormality is a wonderful thing. I should accept it as a reality of life. It consistently make me feel that I should, you know, distance myself from this. So there always, you know, a dichotomy is created. This, this, this existential dichotomy is very much there, which you also uh, brought to the fourth when you were talking briefly about, I think, therefore I am, that, that Descartesian uh, aspect. So I was just wondering that why do you think that only that within this dichotomy, why do you think we are more interested or we are more drawn towards that notion of paranormality, that nauseatic notion of paranormality as portrayed by the Western media, and we are less inclined towards our own cultural, indigenous cultural notions of paranormality, as you have portrayed through Bhutanese cultures, it's the same in different indigenous cultures across India, South Asia, and across the world. Why do you think we are drawn more towards us, towards that particular Western stereotypical notion when we have multiple dimensions of paranormality, multiple dimensions of truth that exists that centers on the notion of paranormality within our indigenous communities? If you can, you know, throw some perspectives on it. So, so thank you for the really rich, interesting question. Um, just to clarify, when you, when, when you say, why are we, we interested, do you mean um, that contemporary people tend to gravitate towards these particular cultural representations? Absolutely. I think that's a, I think that's a really uh, interesting question. I think that gets into a larger question of how these dimensions of experience are sort of culturally um, managed within different, at this point, really coexisting because of the sort of processes of globalization, sort of coexisting cultural value systems that, you know, ra you know kind of overlap at this point. Um, On the one hand, it's hard for me to really speak to that because, because I can't really speak to the cultural experience of, of a sort of contemporary person that coexists with, you know, from my experience, my frame of reference for that would be um, having uh, uh, back, you know, I was uh, baptized as a Roman Catholic when I was young, so I, I went to church as a as very young child. Um, but then I was exposed to these popular cultural representations of the paranormal. And so those those kind of that kind of traditional and modern model sort of coexist in my mind, but I don't know that there's the same kind of um, uh, separate. I guess the equivalent for me would be, why do I, you know, do do people uh, do, you know, is there a gravitation towards uh, animistic traditions, say, within indigenous cultures and other parts of the world, that, which could be a part uh, partial answer that that people that you know, charisma as a kind of um, kind of sociological phenomenon can undoubtedly be a attached to like exoticism in, in, in both contexts. Now there's a, there's a kind of model that like the whole thing reduces to fetishes, you know, kind of in, in the kind of non-traditional sense, fetishization or exoticizing but I think what that leaves out is uh, it, it treats all of these phenomena as symptomatic, which is which kind of downplays the um, the their epistemic plausibility, right? Their their possible ontological reality. It, it says these are just sort of cultural values, and and all this amounts to is a sort of um, you know play of uh, prestige and cult cultural capital in these things. Um, that's one possible explanation. The, you know, the other possible explanation is that, you know, I, it's actually the first time I, I, I didn't realize until you just asked the question that sort of that contemporary, you know, uh, people in, in India or Bhutan are, are sort of drawn to sort of Hollywood cultural representations. But I think there's a kind of interesting question be, behind this of like, where the paranormal migrates within a particular cultural order. 
I think there's a kind of innate drive towards these experiences that if you think about tr sort of traditional accounts of the sacred is highly ambivalent. So, so traditional accounts of the sacred always describe it as this sort of combination of attraction and fear, right? That's in the idea of the numinous, there's the kind of, there's the kind of aversion or fear of the sacred and attraction to it. And that you see that with sort of contemporary popular cultural representations of say horror, horror cinema, right? The, the genre of horror. But what's different is that the fear is kind of managed by a kind of epistemological disavowal where we can go and experience this sort of ambivalent attraction to uh, horror in a movie theater, you know, watching something on Netflix and sort of manage that, that impulse in a particular way within a larger distribution where we, we understand it differently. You're sort of protected from it. And I think actually the marginalization of the paranormal as the parapsychology as a field of science, there's a lot of work on the kind of sociology of that process. And it has to do with the kind of role of taboo within scientific praxis that, that science, you know, science, there's a kind of self representation that it's not affected by kind of traditional mores, but, but a lot of the work in science studies talks about the role in which implicit taboos kind of structure this division of labor. So I think it might, you know, another possible answer to look for would be the way that taboos are distributed or differentiated differently within societies where sciences hold epistemological authority as opposed to uh, traditional cultures where these m mythologies and religious institutions still carry a kind of uh, epistemological authority. I hope that spoke to your question. I think that's that's uh, that's fantastic, especially those those aspects which you you brought out about the cultural capital, about the conflicts between science and spirituality, which is always very much there. Yeah, thanks thanks a lot. I think that's kind of answers. And also, like in the in the near future, would like to listen more about your 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 perspectives about this paranormality and folklore. It's a, it's a very fascinating space that you engaged with. Uh, I think we have one question, uh, um, though though this like. Uh, I would like to present the question to you. The question is from Rajshree Suresh, and um, uh, she asks that we have come across stories of children who remember their previous births. Uh, she's asking that how is this possible? Like from a maybe from a psychological or psychoanalytical perspective, is there any explanation? Like she she wishes to know. Uh, the, uh... I can't give it an answer to how it's possible. I can, well, there's a, you know, there, there are traditional answers within uh, sort of Buddhist um, doctrine, uh, Buddhist epistemology that, that basically there are uh, karmic imprints that are contained within what's known as the Alaya Vijnana, which is the, the storehouse consciousness. People sometimes associate this with the Jungian collective unconscious and that these karmic imprints uh, sort of cause sort of propelled the mind stream of a particular consciousness from one life to the next. That would be the traditional explanation. Within a scientific context, um, the last uh, scientist I mentioned, Ian Stevenson at the University of Virginia published another, a number of books, um, finding case studies of children who remembered their past lives. Um, I don't know whether Stevenson uh, postulated uh, possible scientific explanations for this. Um, this research is continued at the University of Virginia nowadays in the uh, Division of Perceptual Studies, Department of Perceptual Studies. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, you know, one of the interesting questions that's come up in people that do that among people that do parapsychological research is differing account, differing traditional accounts of near death experiences um, and uh, sort of theories mm -hmm. of the continuity of consciousness after death, because once you start, you know, part of the, the sort of problematic is sort of comparing different traditions uh, that, that formulate different explanations of afterlife. So within, um, in one field of uh, sort of para paranormal activity that happened in the United States known as spiritualism, um, a number of people would hold these sort of seances and practices where they would purportedly 
um, you know, interact with dead spirits. Uh, there's reportage of actual sort of all, all kinds of things within the literature and the documents of this that, that you can find actual academic studies of people that have gone and studied this. And part of the questions that come up are, um, are the phenomena that are reportedly attributed to, to spirits of the dead actually a question of just human consciousness, um, the, the boundary between the mind and the world um, being porous in some sense. And actually it's the people that are doing these activities that are somehow making these events happen. They're experiencing their own telling of it. They're uh, kind of describing it as spirits of the dead, right? So it's actually something in their own consciousness that's able to say, make a, make a book fly across the room or make them sort of speak, you know, have reports of spirit possession and all of these things but it's actually a kind of um, alienated aspect of their own consciousness that they're experiencing. Um, and a lot of parapsychologists, uh, a number of them have like posit this, and this actually would then sort of challenge the view of these sort of, uh, uh, sort of children's recollection of past experiences. I could imagine there being some explanation of this being uh, explicable through the, uh, parapsychological categories like um, uh, precognition, right? So, so it, uh, there's, an, there's one theory that precognitive experiences of being able to know future events can allow people to know things about that they shouldn't be able to know technically because somehow they're getting that access to future knowledge that's giving them this information. So uh, short answer, I, there's a number within, the, within traditional uh, sort of literature and within the sort of scientific and historical and parapsychological literature, there's a number of contending explanations, but basically it boils down to does, does reincarnation exist in the way that these traditions say it does, or is it a kind of a phenomenon that's ultimately explicable through other also paranormal but not reincarnation based principles. So I think we will just uh, thank you so much again. And I think we will just uh, request uh, uh, the last question, um, Dr. Rajeshri to go ahead with the question and then we can move into the wrap up and move into the next speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, Ted. I think that was a very interesting study. Uh, congratulations for that. But I have a question and I'm not sure if I'll be able to put exactly what I have in my mind in very clear terms, but let me try. Uh, I think you made a claim at one point. I'm not sure if this is your claim or you are citing other researchers who, who claim that uh, sociocultural studies of religious systems, especially in especially Eastern religious systems, are not sufficient. Uh, but um, let's say we do agree with this new uh, interest in paranormal approaches towards understanding the spiritual and religious claims in these religions. Uh, but um, what happens if we do agree with that, or if we do take up that approach, what happens to the sociocultural implications of the kind of spiritual and religious explanations of phenomena or the metaphysical world that are provided by these religious systems? And here I would like to make a general, not just Eastern religious systems or any religious system in the world, any major religious system in the world. What happens to the sociocultural aspects? Because it is, I don't think it is ever possible to uh, just uh, simply separate the sociocultural you know, aspects of a religious system from its spiritual and religious teachings or its core uh, religious principles, because I think more than the spiritual uh, elements within a, a, a religion, ultimately it's, it's the social cultural implications which actually, uh, you know, become more important or they are, they, you know, they spread across the masses. Uh, especially I was thinking from the point of view of marginalized genders or marginalized groups within the society. Because if we assume that these teachings, they are you know, true, looking from a paranormal point of view, what happens to all those discriminatory um, attitudes, all those discriminatory structures, which, are, which become validated if we uh, look at, if we approach these teachings from uh, this new approach, which, is, which you say has become 
um, which you say has uh, garnered a lot of recent interest within the academia. Uh, I that, hope I'm able to do. No, that was great. That's a really uh, important and, and, and well-stated question. So thank you for asking that. Um, short answer, I think in the end, nothing, nothing happens to those approaches. You asked what happens to yeah. these other approaches. I don't think anything happens to them. I think it's a, you know, the claim, I think, I think it's this claim from, Kri from Jeffrey Kripal that it, it's a question of, ex uh, of kind of exclusive monopoly on the explanation. Right. If we say that, if we say that a a kind of uh, historical materialist or you know post-structuralist approach has the kind of um, exclusive rights on the on and the exhaustive interpretation of these accounts, there and and he's really speaking from a context in which religious studies scholars, uh, most of them in the United States, have for decades been saying. Um, all religion is entirely reducible to these historical power struggles. That, that, that the entire phenomenon and institution of religion is, can be explained as reducible to those things. And his point is that what this leaves out is this idea that what, what the literature and the tradition of, of the paranormal suggests about religion and about the sacred is that there's this core of this other thing happening simultaneously, right? So what he, what he suggests, and, and this makes sense to me, is that there's a kind of double hermen, what he calls a double, double hermeneutic required. He talks about two bars, right? There's one bar that suggests that we, we can get to the point of saying that these tradition, that these, something that these traditions describe that seems incredible to us, that in some sense it happens, but there's another bar that he says we, we don't want to sort of go to, which is that it happens in exactly the way in which the traditions say it happens, right? So, and that's the point at which um, uh, uh, sort of, I mean, dogmas, um, s sort of social struggles, power dynamics, all of the, the in the sort of management of the paranormal core of these traditions by particular societies and cultures to make them into to institutionalize them then this other layer of sort of cultural interpretation enters in and both of these things are kind of coexisting simultaneously they're kind of layered so this requires us to have a, a hermeneutic approach an interpretive approach that can that can sort of see how these two these two and probably multiple layers are interacting so how power dynamics i mean we could talk about the the Mahasiddhas within a uh, within the tradition of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Mahas in the Indian Mahasiddha tradition, these are tremendously antinomian kind of uh, transgressive figures, um, you know. And you find these traditions within the Tibet, but but within the sort of historical study of the transmission of this into Tibet, you see certain consolidations of uh, of these. Um, you know, of these teachings into particular institutional doctrinal forms. And that's where power dynamics, gender dynamics, social historical dynamics enter in and begin to shape things. So again, I'll, I wanna keep this short, but I, I don't think anything happens to those approaches other than they need to be modified with a, attention to an appreciation of the phenomenological dimensions um, with sort of inter, you know, just with, a kind of non-reductionist approach to consciousness within uh, within culture, right? So it's an idea that consciousness is sort of embedded within culture, and the two things are interacting. So I, I hope that that speaks to your question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That was, I think, a very good answer. Yeah. So thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Edward, once again for this fascinating, fascinating lecture. It was amazing. And uh, thank you for all the people who have joined. And now, without wasting further time, uh, we would move into another very, very interesting session by uh, Gopilal Acharya, and who is already with our next speaker, Gopilal Acharya. And I mean, at least those who are from Bhutan, he is a very, very familiar name and outside as well. Uh, he is uh, an award-winning writer, journalist. Uh, he worked as a chief editor of Bhutan's first English language private newspaper, 
Bhutan Times and uh, later founded a weekly uh, newspaper called The Journalist. Apart from that, he has written in various, various platforms like CNN, Telegraph, uh, Straight Times, South Asian Monitor, to name a few amongst many. And he's the author of several amazing books like Bhutanese Folk Tales, Dancing to Death, and his very recent byline. And I'm pretty sure many of you who are from Bhutan have already started reading it, and you must be finding it amazing, which is a combination and amalgamation of various fictional and non-fictional um, aspects. And uh, so uh, he has his, uh, he had a master's of uh, global journalism from or Orebro University in Sweden and a postgraduate certificate in education from the Samse College. And today uh, he is going to speak about South Asia's contribution to global literature. And so without wasting any further time, I sincerely request our very dear speaker, uh, Mr. Gopilal Acharya, to take over and uh, enlighten us. So, hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Thank you for accepting our invitation and a warm welcome to you. We are eager to listen to you. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. It's been, uh, I think, uh, a uh, long time that we have been trying to catch hold of uh, each other. Yes. <laughs> uh, obviously, you know, I was looking forward to coming to Yenpula last year. Uh, yeah. the year before, but something went wrong. And uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm able to be here today. Yeah. At uh, least virtually it materialized. Yes. And uh, uh, please uh, do manage my PowerPoints. Yeah, sure. It's my pleasure. I'll do that. Okay. So anyway, uh, to all the participants, uh, good morning from Thimpu. And uh, I'm, as introduced by uh, uh, Dr. Sayan, Dr. Day, I think uh, introduced me already. I'm a journalist by profession. Uh, I don't have that rigorous academic training that uh, all of you have undergone in the course of your academic life. Uh, I enjoy literature, so, you know, as a journalist, I have always enjoyed, uh, you know, uh, writing others, uh, people's stories, you see. So the way journalism is connected to literature, am I being clear? Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's so clear. the connection, I think the connection between journalism and uh, literature is that uh, we all tell stories. In journalism, we tell stories of people, of places, of uh, things, of ideas. We explore uh, concepts, ideas, uh, very similar to what uh, literature does. Uh, so the point of convergence here is that, uh, you know, both literature and journalism uh, serve as vehicle uh, for uh, greater ideas for uh, telling uh, stories. And uh, as I will, as I will uh, later talk about, stories are the anchor of our identities, uh, of our communities, of our societies. Uh, the day we stop telling our stories, uh, I think uh, we will stop progressing as uh, uh, civilizations. So that's why telling stories is very important. And uh, today, as you, you will see, I'll briefly talk about uh, South Asia has been a focus, I think, in the 20th, later half of the 20th and this 21st century. South Asia is very much uh, in the focus, global focus, not only because of the rise of India as a world uh, superpower uh, and also China, partly, but also because uh, now the scholars, especially from the West, are according, you know, that uh, interest as well as respect to our literary heritage that uh, we did not have for many, many centuries. Uh, uh, there was no acknowledgement of uh, the greatness. I think the, the beauty of uh, South Asian literary consciousness, that's something that uh, we have been seeing in the past uh, uh, 20, 30, 40 years. That's why today you see most uh, universities in the West have a South Asia center or they have a South Asia department. 
And that shows that uh, we are now, uh, you know, we are now in the limelight and it becomes uh, more important for us to continue to tell our stories. So let, let me start my uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, Dr. Chita. Yes, sir. Here it is. Yeah, that's a, it's a very loosely titled as South Asia's contribution to global literature. It's a huge landscape. And uh, I will be briefly running through some of the important uh, landmarks, some of the important milestones. Uh, I might, uh, you know, skip certain things. So uh, it's, it's not, a, it's, I've tried to make it into a, as much chronologically possible as, you know, as much as possible, but uh, I might uh, have skipped certain things. But I want to talk about uh, why South Asia matters. Uh, not just today, but uh, historically, South Asia has been important, I think, uh, as a center of uh, world's oldest civilizations. So I'm going to take you through all this. Uh, let's go to the next slide, Dr. Chita. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you wanted this. You wanted this? Mm -hmm. Is it right, sir? Yeah, the first one, I think. Number two, slide number two, yes. Yes. Yeah. So South Asia, I think, uh, you know, it, it's, it's tradition, the great tradition of South Asia has uh, multiple elements. As uh, we know that, uh, you know, right from the ancient days, we have been, the region has been a melting point of uh, civilizations, uh, both indigenous and prehistoric. We have had Mesopotamia, Mesopotamian influence, Indo-European influence, Aryans, uh, Greek, Mongol, uh, Arab, as well as uh, uh, Persian. You'll see that uh, whether through trade or whether through exchange of, uh, whether through wars, somehow South Asia has been in the focus. We have had uh, uh, you know, Muslim invaders coming into India. We have had, uh, you know, uh, the, the great, uh, you know, Genghis Khan and, uh, you know, the, the Mongols coming right down into the Indian empire. So we have had a lot of, uh, you know, uh, we have had uh, multiple points of convergence uh, from various uh, different uh, uh, world civilizations and, uh, Let's go to next, ma'am. And uh, the interesting thing is that we have also been uh, linked by not just one or two traditions, uh, spiritual traditions, but also that of, uh, you know, the great Hindu, Buddhist, and later Islamic traditions came together. There has been, uh, in, especially in literature, wonderful marriage of uh, these uh, uh, different traditions that have resulted in uh, great literary works. And the, at the same time, uh, our region, the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, South Asian region, has a very rich diversity of regional languages, more than 1,000 different languages and dialects spoken. You know, wonderful local customs, religious beliefs and practices, dress, cuisines. All this adds to the richness of our diversity. Uh, three major languages, I think the Sanskrit, uh, the Sanskrit derived languages, the Dravidian from the uh, South Indian part. Then we have the Tibetan Burman family of languages, uh, especially in uh, Nepal, Bhutan, Sikkim, 
parts of, uh, you know, no Northeast India and uh, parts of Myanmar, all influenced by uh, Tibeto-Burman family of languages. So all these uh, uh, went on to, you know, enrich South Asia as a major uh, point, uh, especially in the ancient times, uh, as a major point of uh, world civilization. Uh, let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, so when we talk about South Asia, the Indian subcontinent in general, India stands out because it has been the crucible uh, of uh, art, literature, civilization in South Asia. And uh, as the British Empire uh, it called it, you know, the India is the jewel in the crown. That's what the, of the British Empire, that's what uh, the, the English called. And then what happened was that, uh, you know, we also had uh, during this time, Indians, mostly, you know, the indentured laborers were forced to migrate to various parts of the empire. And, uh, you know, uh, that led to the, the, the diasporic expansion. Obviously, we continue to remain as part of the mysterious East, the Romantic Orient as uh, represented by, you know, India and its uh, wonderful ancient culture. Now, India really stands out. That's why sometimes uh, it probably gets little, you know, I'm sure to the little other smaller nations in South Asia, because Indian culture, the Indian heritage, the Indian legacy has dominated South Asia. And often when there's a generic reference to South Asia, we often talk about, uh, uh, with focus mainly on India. Uh, however, I think uh, needless to say, India has been, the subcontinent has been the crucible of uh, our civilization, of our literature. Let's go to the next uh, slide. Uh, if you look at, uh, I think we went back. Slide number six, yeah. So the India as the crucible of Asian literature. If you look at the Indian influence, it uh, you know it 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 really spread at one point at one point of time to many countries that today have Islamic traditions. That this includes Indonesia, Malaysia, and uh, obviously uh, Thailand. Uh, where the influence of Sanskritic uh, traditions are still very strong. So Indian tradition basically has given much to the world. If you go back to the classical times, we have had, uh, I think, uh, you know, the immortal epics of, uh, you know, Ramayana, Mahabharata, which are comparable to Homer's you know, Iliad and Odyssey, in fact, in terms of a scale. Uh, we have had uh, Kalidasa's poetry influencing generations of uh, poets, not only in India, but also Western scholars. And uh, next, number six, please. And also in Mahabharata, you know, it gave the Bhagavad Gita, a text that is extensively read and interpreted by Western philosophers and scholars even today, most notably by Henry David Thoreau, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Willem von Humboldt, Hermann Hess, all these uh, uh, great philosophers, scholars were influenced heavily by the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, for them, this text became the, 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 the uh, I would say the, the torch in, in, the, in, the, in the dark times that Walt often went through. If you look at what, uh, uh, you know, David, uh, Henry David Thoreau had to say about Gita. Let's go to the next, uh, number seven. He says that in morning, in the morning, I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seem puny and trivial. As much as uh, at one time, we looked at India as uh, the point of origin of the Eastern civilization. 
uh, Gita was, the Bhagavad Gita was looked at as the core of, uh, you know, the literature, the, the emanation of all great thoughts was uh, often uh, linked to the Bhagavad Gita uh, by both by Eastern and Western philosophers. Uh, next, please. Again, Wilhelm von Humboldt, he said of Gita, the most beautiful, he said, perhaps the only true philosophical song existing in any known tongue, perhaps the deepest and loftiest thing in the world, the thing the world has to show. So if you look at this, you know, the, the influence of our classic, uh, classical literature, though spiritual in nature, that's something I'll discuss a little later. Uh, the difference between our more spiritual canons and uh, the Western, uh, you know, more, uh, uh, you know, humanistic canons. Uh, that has been the major difference, which we'll talk later. And uh, what happened was uh, it didn't end there. And then, you know, in the 16th and 18th century, we have had the Islamic tradition came in through the Mughal empires, the through successive Mughal emperors, Jahangir and Shah Jahan, Aurangzeb, they extended the Mughal Empire and uh, they, under them, art and architecture flourishes once again, right? Uh, you know, if you talk about this great Mughal poets, you know, the, the, the poets who sang, who read out, who recited in the quotes of the great Mughal emperors, people like Gauni Kashmiri, Birbal, Bhagwandas, Bulle Shah, Mirza Galif, these were the people who influenced the, 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 the literary scene at that time, mostly through their poetry. But then as many beautiful things and in life, the Mughal empire goes into decline. And uh, then comes uh, you know, the 18th century darkness in the Indian subcontinent, because that's when the, uh, the British and the French East India companies come in with their troops and mercenaries and colonize India. For the next uh, another hundred years, we see that uh, India is subjugated, the Indians are subjugated. And, uh, you know, they colonize, they not just colonize, but they actually, they trash our literature, the great literature. And uh, uh, let's go to look at uh, the, uh, what I call personally, the great Macaulay arrogance. This is what uh, he had to say. That, you know, Lord Macaulay, Thomas Babington Macaulay. He said that a single shelf of a good European library is what the whole native literature of Indian Arabia. So that's what I have to say about him. He was an arrogant ass. You know? And uh, if you go back, Macaulay was a man, like many, like many British uh, officials who came to India. They divided the world into civilized and barbarian nations, which the Bible does, by the way. And for him, Britain represented the high point of his idea of civilization. And uh, India, South Asia was a land of heathens, uh, you know, lesser humans, barbarians. Now contrast these to what uh, the 20th century poet, the great uh, Mexican poet of Tavio Paz, who also served as the Indian ambassador had to say about uh, India's and overall South Asia's greatness in his work. He took inspiration from you know, classical Sanskrit uh, poets like Halidasa and others to, to, to develop his own uh, uh, po you know, poetic nuances. Another of uh, Macaulay's, uh, you know, in his minute on Indian education, he says that it is, I believe, no exaggeration to say that all the historical information which has been collected from all books written in Sanskrit language is less valuable than what may be found in the most paltry abridgment used at preparatory schools in England. I think uh, Lord Macaulay failed to really understand because he came at a time when British were at the height of their colonial power. I think uh, the prejudices of the British that he so very, uh, you know, uh, openly uh, exudes 
showed that uh, he was blind to the greatness of the country that he was in. But it just wasn't Macaulay. There were other writers, the other white writers who continued to explore the East-West themes in the walls. But then they didn't find, uh, you know, ultimate, there was no ultimate reconciliation. The point of convergence that was arrived through universal values eventually fell apart. And uh, uh, let's go to the other one. And I think that was mainly because what we just discussed in the earlier session, right? The whole spiritual, the paranormal, reincarnation, uh, you know, the, the survival of the soul after the human body leaves. I think all that, the spiritual dimension was in a direct contrast to the Western humanism because the whole, at the core, the Western humanism celebrated uh, life as it was, as it is, and nothing beyond it. Not what, nothing that was anticipated beyond life. The Western humanism also insists that human virtues do not necessarily owe anything to religious intervention. And that the idea of human condition is what we see in real life. It has nothing to do with uh, what in Buddhist, Buddhist tradition we believe through the law of uh, cause and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the law of karma, the cause and effect, okay? Now, if you look at the, in the East, we celebrate something higher than human life. We celebrate the ideals of human virtues that are accountable to a higher authority as signified by our religious and spiritual beliefs. We believe in divine interventions and uh, we don't believe that humankind is on its own. So there was a collision of uh, perception of life in a larger scale of imagination. And that's where I think the major collision between the East and the West took place. Perhaps that's why in my next slide, you know, uh, Kipling's famous lines still ring true, where he says, East is East and West is West, West and never the twin shall meet till earth and sky stand presently at God's great judgment seat. Uh, let's go to the next one. If you look at, uh, you know, similar themes recur in a lot of other writings. If you look at E.M. Foster's very, you know, uh, uh, this was uh, also a seminal work, uh, Passage to India, which, uh, you know, talks about the very, you know, anomalous friendship between a white and a brown man that uh, ends in, that ends in, uh, again. Uh, complete, uh, you know, the friendship falls apart and it ends in a complete uh, misunderstanding of the East and the West. Orwell's writing, though not consciously, explores similar themes, especially from his Burmese days. Uh, let's go to another one. The Sir, are you there with us? I think there is a there is a brief network error on the part of the speaker. So, uh, but no worries. We can surely um, wait for some time and uh, wait for our speaker to join back. Is this clear now? Okay, can you hear me? Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, so what happens is, uh, you know, uh, despite the darkness that was wrought up in the Indian subcontinent because of uh, the colonization 
of uh, the subcontinent, we see that uh, you know, in the late 19th and early 20th century, we see a rich flowering of Indian literature and art. Uh, principal pioneer being, uh, you know, Rabindranath Tagore, who stimulated new creative forms, not only in Bengali poetry, but in our art forms. His influence, I think, uh, has a lasting impression. And uh, that is the beginning. In fact, beginning, uh, a, turn a turning point in South Asia's, uh, uh, in South Asia's, uh, you know, uh, mm -hmm. legacy again, because the West notices the greatness of uh, Rabindranath Tagore. And uh, there's an acceptance that uh, uh, slowly builds over that uh, the East does have great legacy. Today, uh, let's go to next one, number 20, slide 20. And uh, if you look at today, you know, the English writers mainly I'll, I'll also come to this a uh, little later. The writers you know, who write in English, mainly of India and South Asian origin, they, continue, they have continued to make great contribution to the world literature. The only forgotten side are the voices from the margins that uh, I would like to talk a little later. Uh, because what dominated in the aftermath, in the end, of colonial period was the post-colonial literature. There was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I think, uh, expo exploration of uh, colonial themes post in the post-colonial literature. And uh, it included a lot of South Asian names. Chiefly, you know, we have, uh, you know, P.S. Nepal, Salman Rushdie, Amit Chaudhary, people like Amitabh Ghosh, Kiran Desai, and a host of other writers that uh, I'm not naming here explored this cause of uh, uh, colonialism uh, in their world. Today, I think host of writers in India, the, then let's go to the next one. We have, uh, you know, people like Chumpala Heri has become the voice of uh, diaspora in, uh, in the West today. People like Rohinton Mystery who lives in Canada, right, but who has a, uh, uh, heritage from Mumbai, from Bombay, you know, writes about, uh, uh, you know, uh, writes about his, uh, the Indian legacy. You have uh, Vikram Seth, Saman Rushdie, you know, Amitabh Ghosh, Chitra Banerjee, Deepak Karuni, and many others, in fact, that I'm not able to list here. Similarly, you know, in the, if you talk about uh, the Pakistanis who write in English and we have, rose, we have, we have risen to fame of late, Moshin Hamid and Kamila uh, Samshi. Sri Lanka, this young writer last year made a huge, uh, you know, uh, ripple with his, uh, with his uh, this Tamil writer, uh, Anuk Arudu, uh, Arud Pragrasam. His uh, novel that is set in the uh, the, the Tamil war, guerrilla war, made a huge, uh, again, ripple, ripples in the world literature. Similarly, there's Naomi Munawira. And then we have, uh, you know, uh, let's go to the next one. The Nepalese writers, Samrat Pade, Yudhu Sushrema, Manjushri Thapa, Devakota, you know. These are some of the names that uh, ring. I mean, if you are interested or if you if you are interested to explore Nepalese literature, modern Nepalese literature. Uh, we have in Bangladesh, uh, I don't have it in the, I don't have it in my slides, but uh, in Bangladesh, we have people like, you know, uh, modern writers like Tashlima Nasrin, Tahamima Anam. Uh, and the old lot like my internet has been a little poor. Can you hear me? 
If you look yes. at uh, the yes. kind of themes that South, South Asian writers have continued to explore in the work, these are identity you know, of the indigenous culture. I think we have already talked about this, how important it is for us as a, as a society, as a community, as a nation, as a civilization. Slavery and cultural dominance, I think the idea of cultural imperialism is being discussed even today. Uh, uh, inequality, racism, homelessness and ruthlessness, indigenous history, as well as political and economical dimensions of uh, the socially oppressed. Uh, these have been some of the themes. Uh, let's go to the next one. And then there are modern themes now, the new themes that are coming up. Feminism, feminism and women empowerment, globalization and, and its consequences, urbanization, the quest for individual identity. In one of uh, yesterday's session, I think, uh, one of the speakers talked about why this young Indian Canadian writer was uh, uh, disavowing in all relationship to Sita. Because I think uh, what modern writers are, are, are increasingly doing is, you know, they're looking at inward at the individual as singular identity. If our older uh, ancient literature looked at us as a society, it didn't look at us as individuals, but as a society. Modern literature is increasingly exploring the self. The individual identity has become very important today. A lot of uh, you know, books, not only from South Asia, but from all around the world today. If you look at uh, you know, uh, the, the book, uh, The Vegetarian that won the Man Booker International you know, two years back, written by South Korean writer, it explores again the idea of uh, self-identity in the background of uh, the generic social setting. So that is what is happening, and that's why I think we're just avoiding society in our, in our uh, exploration more and more. That's what uh, the writers seem to do. It is now your identity that you're exploring more, uh, and then of course, the, you know, the many socio-political concerns. Obviously, in India, there are things like, uh, you know, corruption is a recurrent theme in modern literature. Things like uh, loyalty, urban poverty, sorry, rural poverty, all these are explored. Uh, Arvind Adiga in his book, The White Tiger, explores some of these uh, interesting themes. So now I come to, you know, the last part of my uh, the presentation. And here I want to talk about uh, why our narrative, uh, you know, should slightly change. Uh, what has happened with South Asia? When you talk about South Asia as a generic, uh, you know, in a in a in a in a single in a, in a single context, we are looking at uh, South Asia as represented by those who are able to write in English. Uh, the the South Asian writers writing in English, or the works that have been translated in English that get noticed more prominently, right? Uh, these are the voices that have uh, gone across the world. Uh, unfortunately, you know, South Asia is not only the literature written in English or translated in English. South Asia is much more than that. You know, it's a beehive, like I'd like to say, you know, within which there are multiple identities, cultures, traditions, and uh, languages. Let's go to the next one. Then. There, and it's important to look into each compartment or chamber of the hive because uh, there lies a distinct world, a totally different world of identities, literature, and cultures. These are Hindi, Tamil, Bengali, Assamese, Nepali, Patanese, Urdu, Konkani, Kashmiri, Odia, Bhojpuri, Mizo, Punjabi, Pashto, Sinhalese, Tibetan, Marathi, Malayalam, and you know many other languages that we often overlook when we talk about South Asia. Many wonderful writers from these subgroups go unnoticed in the bigger English speaking world, unless they're translated, right? And these are the voices from the margin that I was talking about earlier, and they must be heard. That is where South Asia should head uh, eventually. I think uh, these voices from the margins deserve to be heard more than ever before. This, uh, you know, 
Pablo, Mexican white writer, Leslie Marmon Silco, I'm sure some of you would have read a book, in a seminal novel ceremony, talks about the importance of each community's story. You know, she talks about uh, why it's important to preserve our idea of identity, our legacy, our cultural heritage through telling of stories. <clears throat> and uh, she says, let's go to the next one. Uh, she says that, uh, you know, in one of her poems, the evil is mighty, but it can stand up to our stories. So they try to destroy the stories, let the stories be confused or forgotten. They would like that. They would be happy because we would be defenseless then. So without our stories that connect to our uh, identity, to our roots, we would be defenseless. We would be rudderless, right? And uh, that's why in today's larger context, if you look at uh, the bigger dominant cultures, the, the whole idea of cultural imperialism is not just the Western culture uh, coming in and subsuming the Eastern culture, but it's also about dominant uh, cultures within our countries trying to assimilate the smaller ones. That is the danger that we, the literature has to, I think, fight against. And that's why it's the duty of each writer, small or big, uh, from these smaller societies, smaller communities to continue telling our stories. That's the only way South Asian voices will continue to reverberate, I think, will continue to expand. Otherwise, we are monopolizing South Asia as a voice that appears in the uh, English canons and not in the canons of our indigenous uh, dialects and languages. That's where South Asian literature must next head to. That's my personal feeling. I think we need to hear more of the voices from the margin. These stories that have remained untold or that have remained within the four walls of people's homes of uh, those, uh, uh, those uh, communities that are at the margins. For example, Dalit stories in India need to be told. Similarly, I think uh, in many societies, we have these stories that are still hidden that, that are dying to be told. And that's, I think, a duty of uh, each of us as scholars, as writers, as academics, I think, to uh, create to kind of uh, uh, give uh, this direction to where South Asia must head in its story. So I will end here and thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, um, sir, for this very enlightening uh, presentation about how uh, Various in various ways, uh, how first of all South Asia, the very notion, the very very phenomenon of South Asia is being stereotyped across the globe, and we know that socially, culturally, politically, and from creatively and from various other dimensions, uh, South Asia by default it means to people it's India and China, and uh, this is why uh, when we go across the world or not even across the world, even even within South Asia as well. Uh, many people don't know that Bhutan is a different country. It's a separate country. Many people have a weird idea that it is somewhere uh, located in India. So personally, I have, if I talk from my personal experience, I have often encountered the question, so where do you work? I say in Bhutan, and so in which part of India Bhutan is? Or the second usual question is in which part of Nepal Bhutan is? So as if Bhutan is a state, Bhutan is a territory, but uh, there are a lot of people across the world who doesn't know that Bhutan is a country or where is it located. So from these you know, subtle examples of life, we understand that how underrepresented the very phenomenon, because South Asia is not just a geographical space, we understand. It is also a phenomenological space where we bring in different cultures, traditions, lifestyles, literary aspects and all. Now you have spoken absolutely a, a lot about why we need to bring in the voices of the margin. So in that way, I mean, apart from Dalits and several other communities that you spoke about, personally, as a cultural outsider, I confess, as a, as a cultural geographical outsider, I, I believe that somewhere, somewhat, the very existence of Bhutan 
from various dimensions, not from every dimension, I don't want to generalize, but from various dimensions, Bhutan's existence lies in the margins. So as a journalist, because you have interacted with people, different people from within the country and abroad with respect to your job, as well as outside with respect to your writings as well, as a journalist from Bhutan, will you mind sharing some practical reasons, some practical factors which you think that keep on contributing and normalizing to this game of stereotyping across the world and why people are not aware of it. It's so normalized. As if, if, if I say Bhutan is in Nepal, it's so, it's so normalized. It's fine if I'm wrong, no, no problem with that. So why is it so? Why, what do you think about it? Right. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, that's absolutely right, especially Bhutan is often invisible to the world. Uh, it's only off late in the last uh, 10, 15 years that, uh, you know, uh, Bhutan has uh, kind of uh, come of age as an independent uh, nation state. Uh, thanks to, you know, uh, the, mature, the maturing of uh, the idea of uh, gross national happiness that has now been uh, traveling, the idea of GNH been traveling uh, across the world. I think uh, the whole philosophy of GNH kind of uh, took Bhutan to a different level. And now I think uh, more and more people know about Bhutan. But like you said, there was a time, there still is time, uh, you know, when you travel abroad and when you tell that you're from Bhutan, people even ask you, you know, is that in India, part of India? Or, you know, is, is it sometimes they even say part of Tibet? In fact, uh, you know, I had an interesting uh, encounter with, uh, you know, an immigration official at the Heathrow airport long time back when I was studying Sweden, I had to transit from Heathrow. When I presented my passport to the lady at the immigration, she looked at my passport and said, what country is this? So I had to say, you know, it's a country like yours. You know? She didn't even say where. She asked, what country is this? You know? And if you look at from there, if you look at where we have come today, Bhutan is often quoted today as a pioneer of, uh, you know, you know, obviously that has been a soft power policy, uh, positioning GNH as a unique uh, Bhutanese contribution to the, uh, you know, the developing uh, I think uh, canon on uh, well-being, human well-being, literature and human well-being, and that's done some good to uh, position Bhutan as uh, a thought leader. So I think uh, we have come a long way, but uh, there still is, uh, I think we got to do a lot. Now, from the journalistic perspective, uh, or even otherwise, Bhutan remained along the margins, uh, under in, in a, with an India shadow for a long time, uh, you know, our 1947 treaty, friendship treaty, I guess, uh, had spelled out that Bhutan would be guided in its foreign uh, policy, in its foreign dealings uh, through India. Well, that would have been one uh, reason that kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, that kind of kept Bhutan under India's shadow. Obviously, the revision of the treaty in 2007 and the signing of the treaty in 2008. Uh, uh, took India and Bhutan relationship to a different level. And uh, Bhutan started conducting its own foreign policy uh, bilaterally with the uh, different countries. So there has been obviously, you know, a renegotiation between the idea of uh, foreign policy between India and Bhutan, because India for India, uh, I think uh, for a very long time, having guided Bhutan uh, in the international affairs, and for India to let it go, uh, you know, was difficult uh, because, uh, uh, you know, it meant, uh, I think, uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a more, uh, uh, in, in, a, in a more, uh, let's say this power sharing, uh, or let's say power negotiating framework, India was letting go one of its uh, very uh, closest and I think, uh, friend uh, into the world of self-determination when it come, came to foreign policy. And that was a big thing for India to happen in 2008. 
and obviously the new government came in and uh, you know we started conducting in in two three years put on an established diplomatic relations in 45 countries so i think uh, this release from indian clutch when it comes to foreign policy dealings probably is now bearing fruits by positioning Bhutan as more of an independent nation state than as uh, India's vassal state that a lot of scholars, Western scholars still think. That's my perspective as a journalist. Thank you. Yes. I mean, I mean, that's what I was like, you know, looking forward because I mean, we can never deny the fact that how uh, Bhutan has been compelled it's, it's not exactly every time out of choice, to be frank, but also being compelled to be in Indian shadows. And we know there are a lot of stories which can be, you know, sometime la later again we can talk about. But without wasting um, further time, I would like to request um, Dr. Rajeshree to go ahead with your question. Yeah, uh, it's a delight to be listening to you in person. Um, I have kind of, a, this is not exactly a question, it is more like a comment. Um, I was thinking that uh, when you presented this uh, historical overview of South Asian literature, it, at some point I felt like nothing was happening in South Asia before the colonizers arrived. Because uh, I don't think we need to measure the word of South Asian culture or South Asian literature based on the fact that they have received this amount of attention or notice from the Western world. We don't need to judge the value of Bhagavad Gita on the basis of the fact that Thoreau and others were inspired by it. We don't need to judge uh, the fact that Indian literature is worth studying or it's worth appreciating because uh, Tagore received a Nobel Prize. Because this would, you know, it kind of makes it sound as if we are dependent upon the West for an acknowledgement of our world and our very existence. And this is a kind of placing the Eurocentric and um, the Western gaze at the very center and putting ourselves at the margin. In fact, even when I begin uh, teaching the module on South Asian literature to my students, I begin with a warning, a disclaimer that um, the truth is that these categories such as South Asia or East Asia or Southeast Asia or the Middle East, these are nothing but um, these are ultimately the products of, uh, well, post-Cold War US imperialist policies. And this is how these categories and you know the studies of literatures or the cultures from these regions in a focused manner, it began uh, in American universities and now it has spread to other parts of the world because uh, even in academia, the American approach is still dominant. Uh, so I think this is a little dangerous to approach a South Asian literature from that point. Thank you. You're absolutely right. Yes. I think we don't need anyone to, you know, endorse our greatness if we do it yeah. ourselves. Yeah. What's happened, I think, uh, in the world of academies, often we have sought that endorsement, you see. I think uh, a lot of scholars have done that, knowingly, unknowingly. But I absolutely agree. We don't need anyone, you know, from outside the region to come and, you know, tell us that, yeah, look, you have great literature, you know, you don't realize it. I think we, we have realized that all along. And that has served us very well, I think. That has kind of uh, proliferated, you know, uh, that has kind of uh, proliferated what, is, what we have produced over time. And that has kind of anchored us within that South Asian identity. So I absolutely agree, yes. But, uh, you know, within the larger context of uh, global literary, uh, you know, uh, global literary scenario, what has hap often happened uh, is that, uh, you know, the Anglo, I mean, the, the Anglo-European, the Western, mostly the European and American uh, literature continues to dominate the discourse, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we have often felt the need of a friend from the West to kind of, you know, propel us to that uh, global forum, you see. So that has been there, I guess. Uh, often we, you know, if we try to do it ourselves, we have either been again sidelined. You needed, we needed a white man to tell the other white man that South Asia is great. A South Asian couldn't do that. So, I think those were those were the kind of you know the dichotomy within our I think uh, 
uh, liter 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 literary legacy. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it still happens in Bhutan, you know, if a Bhutanese tells our Bhutanese people that, you know, look, we have something good here, our Bhutanese won't believe, but you have a white man come in here and tell them, look, this is great. It works. So that syndrome of, uh, you know, endorsement from the West should, I think, go away, you know. I think that was, uh... That was amazingly put. This this syndrome from the West, and it's it's so common in our regular life, and we see that everywhere in the academic space. Also, um, you know, when we write a book, we need an endorsement from someone from the United States or Europe, uh, no matter how rich the person is in reality. But we have this by default attitude. But we really deliberately ignore somebody who is you know just a rich intellectually rich person just sitting aside us but we you know deliberately ignored to just go by that i think that was a fantastic and we already have comments uh, you know sharing about how you pro projected this very idea of this under representation of south asia which is specific focus on bhutan to the audience today uh, I'm, I'm sure in the near future we will have a lot of more such opportunities physically or virtually to you know, interact with you, learn from you, share from, uh, and share with you various other perspectives on it. Thank you so much once again, and uh, for the second amazing lecture. And with this, we move into our our third speaker, and uh, it is uh, Professor Sharif uh, Atiku Zaman. Professor Sharif uh, Atiku Zaman is uh, is a vice principal in the government, BL postgraduate college in Bangladesh. And uh, it, is, it is important to mention about him that uh, he is, apart from being a professor, he's also uh, a biling bilingual author and has published several monographs and edited books in English as well as in Bengali. And uh, we are extremely happy to have him here and especially uh, with respect to this South Asian framework, we already had two fantastic lectures, one on uh, paranormality and folklore, second moving on the uh, question of the representation of South Asia uh, to, to the world. And now we have uh, Professor Sharif to enlighten us about the various aspects of uh, creative writing, literature of South Asia and Bangladesh. So pro uh, Professor, I would like to sincerely invite you to deliver the lecture and enlighten us. Thank you. I don't know whether you get me. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay, first, I would like to thank Onfula Centenary College Authority and Dr. Jai Singh for inviting me to this conference conducted on virtual platform. I am from a country that is in the periphery of India and one that is uh, among the least developed in the subcontinent in terms of its English writing resources. Of course, we have a rich literary heritage, but in vernacular language. Today, I would like to talk on South Asian writing in English and in translation from India, Bhutan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and others. Now, let me uh, tell first, and in fact, uh, it is my query also. What is South Asian literature? The term, I think, South Asian literature refers to the literary works of writers from the Indian subcontinent and its surrounding areas. Countries to which South Asian writers of literature are linked include India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Bhutan. Uh, first, I would like to start with Indian English literature because India is always dominating 
and has been dominating the literary scenario on the subcontinent. We should acknowledge the India that Indian writers among the South Asian countries have been dominating the field of literature written in English for over 100 years. Now, what is English literature? Until the early 19th century, English literature would only mean the literature of the United Kingdom. But now, English literature is the study of literature written in the English language. The writers do not necessarily have to be from England, but can be from all over the world. It includes some history's most famous writers, isn't it? The beginning of Indian English writing, where was it begun from? It is told that its early history began with the works of Henry Louis Vivian Dijeri and Michael Madhusudan Dutta, followed by Rabindranath Tagore and Sri Aurobindo. Later, R.K. Naran, Mulkraj Anand, and Raja Rao contributed to the growth and popularity of Indian English writings in the 1930s. But the first South Asian English writer was from Bihar. The first published South Asian writer was Sheikh Din Muhammad, who had found himself transplanted to England via Ireland and who published Travels of Din Muhammad, a native of Patna in Bengal through several parts of India. It was published in 1794. Uh, and uh, I would like to draw your attention the, about the spelling of uh, Sheikh Din Muhammad. Sheikh was written as S-A-K-E. Muhammad was written as Mahomet. M-A-H-O-M-A-T. And uh, can you remember, Rabindranath Thakur is spelled as Tegor, spelled and pronounced as Tegor. So, Sheikh Din Muhammad was spelled and pronounced as Sheikh Din Muhammad. So, he was the first South Asian English writer. The first Indian creative writing in English the first novel in English by an Indian was uh, Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, Raj Mohan's wife, appeared quite late in 1864, and uh, it is his only novel in English. The rest, 14 successful novels he wrote in Bengali. But prior to Bankim Chandra, Koilash Sundar Dutta wrote another novel, a journal of 48 hours of the year 1945. It was published in 1835, uh, as I said, preceding Bankim's novel. And uh, it was about an imaginary armed uprising against the British but cannot be classified as the first novel as it came out in a journal. Why was English writing developed? Uh, there are several opinions regarding this. It is said as a result of the English colonial rule in India, spanning almost 200 years as a bicultural product. Akira Takashaki of Japan opined that uh, it, 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 is, or it was as a bicultural product. As a development of colonial mindset or feeling the urge of getting global recognition or addressing the global readers, anyone might be. But I think uh, uh, all are correct. The big three. Three novelists are known as the big three in India who contributed a lot to the development of uh, Indian English writing, IEL. 
Raja Rao, Mulkraj Anand, and R.K. Narayan. But uh, IEL, Indian English Literature, got its strong footing and recognition long after post-colonial era. The partition of India had a prolonged, a disturbing, and a traumatic effect on the psyche of millions of Indians and became one of the most discussed, debated, and analyzed theme in many novels. For instance, Kushan Singh's Train to Pakistan, 1956, Salman Rushdie's Midnight's Children, 1981, and Amitabha Ghosh's the Shadow Lines, 1988, deal with the theme of partition in a very different perspective. Post-independence writings, post-independence fiction reflected an anxious reality. On one hand, freedom had been owned. Ostensibly, the exploiter had been expelled and the forces of evil were no longer in the land. But on the other hand, Writers and intellectuals generally felt that the only change affected by independence was the change in the color of the exploiter's skin. In fact, uh, two, two things simultaneously uttered, independence and partition. It, is, it was independence to them who didn't have to live. That means who stayed there in their own land. And it was a partition to them who had to leave their motherland. And what is uh, South Asian literature? I have already told. Language variety in South Asia. <clears throat> South Asia is uh, a home to at least 20 fine languages, including English, each of which has its unique literature. During con colonial rule, English became the administrative and link language, lingua franca, by the colonizing English at the end of the 18th century to replace Sanskrit and Persian. The two languages that had performed similar functions till then, the impulse for South Asian writing in English had been started since then. Language variety in South Asia and English. It uh, happened uh, partly because of colonial policy, but partly also because many Indians saw the advantage of learning and using the language. Here, I would like to quote R.K. Naran. R.K. Naran, uh, uh, why was he interested in writing in English? He told in a very interesting way. Naran said, mm, English, he found uh, English the most rewarding medium to employ for his writing because it came to him very easily. He said, English is a very adaptable language and it is so transparent it can take on the tint of any country. Real beginning of South Asian English writing. The real beginning of South Asian literature in the Indian subcontinent began with the struggle of independence. He works here where uh, Gandhi's Indian Home Rule, it was published in 1990 and dictated into English by Gandhi himself, Tagore's Nationalism, 1917, and essays he wrote like The Spirit of Freedom, collected in his Creative Unity, 1922, Nehru's autobiography, published in 1936, but uh, retitled uh, significantly for the American edition of 1941 as Toward Freedom, the Autobiography of Jawaharlal Nehru and the Discovery of India, 1945. In such works, the colonizer's language was being used effectively by this time, not only to write back, but to propel a discourse that would lead to freedom. Uh, South Asian English writing at the peak. South Asian literature is written in English as well as many national and regional languages of the region. 
after the success of booker prize winning authors like salman rushdi and arundhati roy many people got encouraged and started writing in english south asian literature has been produced in about 30 major languages including translations into persian portuguese french and english it's an important question to me why are english writing of other south asian countries poorer than that of india uh, first the first reason i think for different language policy after the partition after independence the countries of south asia adopted different policies regarding the english language this policy is inevitably impacted on the development of the literature written in English in each country. India planned to use English as an official language for only 15 years. At the end of the period, however, its use in offices was extended indefinitely by the parliament, which made it an associate official language of Hindi. And perhaps, uh, you know, there is a fine essay, satirical essay of R.K. Narayan, R.K. Narayan in this book, a Writer's Nightmare, 15 years, 15 years, and uh, I would like to quote some lines, 15 years, this is, this is the essay, 15 years, and uh, in this essay, there is a trial of English language. And in the court, English language says to the jazz, uh, the jazz uh, says to the English language, because you are not an Indian. English language says, I am more Indian than you can ever be. You are probably 50, 60 or 70 years of age. But I have actually been in this land for 200 years. The judge says, when we said quit India, we meant it to apply to English main as well as their language. So finally, what the English language says, uh, English language says, you probably picture me as a trident wearing rule of Britannia, but actually I am a devotee of goddess Saraswati. I have been her most steadfast handmaid. All that is beside the point. Even you come in a sari with a kumkum on your forehead, we are going to see that you are deported. The judge says, at most we shall allow you will be another 15 years. Then English language says, 15 years from what time? At this, the judge felt so confused that he ordered, I will not allow any more discussion on this subject and rose for the day. So, uh, it's, it's really a, uh, oh, fine essay. Uh, R.K. Narayan, I think R.K. Narayan tried to say that uh, language, when a language gets a strong footing on a country, certainly it is uh, quite impossible to deport it from that country. Uh, Pakistan, on the other hand, didn't stop using English in higher administration, but simultaneously pursued a policy of establishing Urdu as the state language. <laughs> Only students in the West Pakistan educated in a handful of elite schools would get to a position where they could use it creatively. In Sri Lanka, the emphasis was increasing on Sinhalese language after it was made the state language in 19. 56. It meant that English writing in Sri Lanka could not get the momentum for linguistic nationalism. What happened in Bangladesh, you know, 
after the partition uh, the then east pakistan today's bangladesh found herself in a conflict with the west pakistan regarding what would be the state language of pakistan urdu or bangla and there was a language language movement and the people found themselves in a uh, bloody movement and finally they own so as for bangladesh because the country's independence is closely linked to the linguistic nationalism english almost disappeared from higher education for a while not even elite schools are allowed to use english the medium of instruction so consequently dispersed and tentative attempts are made to write in english in india bangladesh pakistan and sri lanka but india was very ahead of success in doing so south asian english flourished mostly in the 1980s why i have already told the linguistic nationalism that followed the partitioning of india deferred the reemergence of the category that would ultimately be called south asian writing in english it would be difficult therefore for scholars in the field to find the level that would allow them to include in it works in produced by writers from india pakistan sri lanka bangladesh nepal for some time what are the factors then that lead to reappearance of the category in the 80s and its consolidation it's a very important question uh first uh, the first reason i think the writers from all across the sub kind of began to use the language spontaneously and inventively from this time onwards owing to greater international mobility new generation of writers educated primarily in english encouraged the use of language in public life also there were enough of them in the subcontinent as well as the west to ensure continuous interest in this kind of writing and third reason uh, i have also referred to after the success of booker prize winning authors like salman rushdie and orunduthi rai many people got encouraged and started writing now uh, i would like to come to the themes of south asian english literature these writers had a lot of things in common whether they were from india sri lanka pakistan or bangladesh their themes setting communities and characters are distinctly south asian whether located in the subcontinent or the west the cluster of themes their characters deal with a uh, colonial the first cluster colonial encounters the advent of nationalism the consequences of partition and nation building in the nascent decolonized state to put it somewhat differently the traumas associated with the political upheavals and violence and the depiction of pitfalls encountered when one set of oppressive rulers are replaced with another set of repressive alveit local ones became an easily identifiable theme of the english language literature of the region another cluster of theme has to do with endemic poverty and the persistence of religious fundamentalism and fanaticism class and caste prejudice patriarchy or patriarchal injustice the plight of women and so on the third cluster of theme is uh, the plight of underprivileged marginalized or steadily disappearing communities the alienated consciousness and cut off from mainstream life the alienation induced by immigration and the trauma of the uprooted and the 
podcast Puri. Uh, now, I would like to give you some references to the text. In India, we get a good number of fine writers who contributed a lot to the writings in English. R.K. Narayan, Raja Rao, Mulkraj, Anand, Salman Rushdie, Vikram Shet, Anita Deshai, Amitabh Ghash, Kuzvan Singh, Anita Nair, Nayantara Segal, Arunduti Roy, Kamala, Suraya, Upamunnu Chatterjee, Sudha Murthy, Dom Morris, Kiran Deshai, Varati Mukherjee, Namita Gokhale, uh, V.S. Naipal, Nirotsi Chaudhuri, Jannabi Borwa, Amit Chaudhuri, Amit Chaudhuri also a classical musician, and so on. And you can um, utter some other names. They're also famous. Uh, the themes of partition, uh, Ark Narayan's Waiting for the Mahatma, 1955, seems to be the first novel to refer the partition in the history of Indian literature in English. Kuzban Singh's Train to Pakistan, uh, just one after that, 1956. Raj Gill's The Rape, 1974. Chaman Nahal's Azadi, 1975. Shibike Kumar's Rivar with Three Bangs, 1998, etc. The partition is the central theme. V. Rajan's The Dark Dancer, 1959, Manohar uh, Malgonkar's Bend in the Ganges, 1964. The partition is not the main theme, but one of the significant themes. The partition appears in an oblique manner in Onita Desha's Clear Light of the Day, 1980. Guru Charan Das is a fine family. K. Abbas, Khaza Ahmed Abbas is the world is my village in 1984, etc. In the postmodernist novels like Salman Rushdie, Midnight Children in 1981, uh, Midnight Children, what a fine novel it is. When he wrote the novel, he was just 34. Salman Rushdie was just 34. What not there? The violence, conflict, the psychological conflict of the characters and uh, a magic realism. And even uh, there is the reference to uh, Bangladesh war. I mean, the liberation war of Bangladesh, uh, <clears throat> Indira Gandhi, Sheikh Mujib, but not. Uh, it's, a, it's a big panorama. Amitabh Ghosh's Shadow Lines, uh, Shashi Tharur's The Great Indian Novel. Now uh, I come to. Uh, uh, the references to some Pakistani English writings. Uh, some references have already given. Pakistani English was started emerging most probably after 1940, right when the freedom movement reached its peak. Ahmad Ali, Mumtaz Shahnaz, and Shahid Sarwardi were the primary contributors to English literature in Pakistan. Firoz Khan known and Khaza Ahmed or Abbas or the others. Ahmed Ali, the first and most prominent uh, Muslim writer who recorded the treacherous acts of a British Raj in subcontinent with a particular sense of despair and dejection. He, in 1940, wrote the Jima post-colonial fiction to light in Delhi, which was set in 1911 in a Muslim neighborhood of Delhi, Firoz Khan earned a great fame of his autobiography from memory, 1966, and from on only novel, Scented Dust, 1941, highlighting the sociological aspects of life in subcontinent the laws of social and religious life in both Muslim and Hindu community. Khaja Ahmed Abbas and Atiyah Hussein. Khaja Ahmed Abbas, who was a socialist and nationalist, wrote two novels, a novella, a drama, and two collections of short stories, two travelogues, and one account of journalism. His famous literary works are Tomorrow is Ours, novel. Blood and Stones, novella. Another important name 
in this decade of 1960s english fiction of pakistan was atia hussein her magnificent novel sunlight on a broken column was published in 1961 it was based on a struggle of getting freedom of action and thinking the most important name of 1960 was julfikar ghosh that was appeared after 1965 Ghosh's novel Murder of Aziz Khan was published in 1967 in the context of the production of English novel in Pakistan during decade of 70s Bafsi Sidhuwa was the prominent name her cracking India is generally referred to as the story about the partition of India Bafsi Sidhuwa uh, uh, was a Parsi woman and uh, uh, from a, a neutral platform she tried to examine the reasons of partition the causes of partition now come to my country bangladesh uh, a lot of short stories and novels have been written but only a few have been translated uh, in fact uh, bangladesh in bangladesh uh, it has a rich literary heritage Uh, a very rich trend of literature but unfortunately uh, the writers don't get their writings translated in english that is why their global exposure is poor uh, the first bangladeshi writer who uh, wrote a novel in 1992 uh, adib khan adib khan Uh, was uh, an immigrant in australia and after 22 years when he came to his own country he found many things changed and in fact uh, uh, after that uh, he decided to write a novel uh, titled uh, seasonal adjustment then uh, comes the name of tahmima anam monica ali uh they uh, uh, born and brought up in england and in fact uh, monica alice bricklin the hamima anams the golden age the good muslims uh, uh, got a uh, worldwide uh, popularity then uh, uh, in fact uh, um, some other uh, writings of uh, bangladeshi writers have been translated nasrin jahan's urukku it has been translated as the woman who flew by kaiser hawk and uh, in fact uh, the most prominent writer on the partition uh, is uh, hasan azizul hawk he writes in bengali and uh, uh, he wrote uh, three three or four novels on the partition because uh, he uh, uh, he could not ignore or evade the trauma he faced during the partition because uh, uh, in bangladesh uh, uh, he came though before the partition after the partition and uh, uh, he felt for his own land uh, i mean uh, uh, it is bardhaman in india and uh, still he is writing uh, on that issue shabitri upakhan has been translated into english by john hood uh, but uh, he uh, has uh, several several uh, novels and short stories on the partition um, and another another writer the diplomat writer said oliulla wrote uh, uh, lal shalu the english version is tree with its roots it is about a man uh, who <clears throat> an individual who came to a remote village and tried to exploit the villagers uh, by uh, by uh, the uh, religious by the religious subt corner and i find a similarity between the, the novel of uh, 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 lal shalu the tree with its roots and uh, the guide of ark narayan there is a very similarity okay that is a different question uh, then comes uh, uh, another novelist and freedom fighter of bangladesh husainuddin husain his uh, 
flood and the noon was uh, translated and uh, published from Delhi. Minerva was the publisher. And uh, his another novel uh, translated by me is going to be published from England. And in fact, uh, uh, I should uh, refer to myself here also. Uh, my anthology of short stories uh, has been published from England in which I included at least three short stories on the partition. So still uh, this issue matters a lot in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh. What happened in Sri Lanka? Road from Elephant Pass is a novel by Nihal de Silva, Sham Salvadurai, Sri Lankan author. Sam Salvadurai's first novel, Funny Boy, a coming of age story, won, by, won the Books of Canada First Novel Award. Then uh, Michael Ondaje is a Sri Lankan born Canadian. Uh, his work includes fiction, autobiography, poetry, and film. He has published 13 books of poetry and has won voluminous awards for his work. Then, Shehan Koruna Tilak, Chinaman is a novel about Sri Lanka and her love for cricket. <laughs> it was hailed by the Gracian Prize judges as one of the most imaginative work of contemporary Sri Lankan fiction. Then uh, Ramesh Gunasekara is a Sri Lankan born British author who was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize for his novel Reef in 1994. He has just a number of literary prizes and was chair of the judges of Commonwealth Short Story Prize competition in 2015. Nepal, uh, what happened in Nepal? After Lakshmi Prashad Dev Kota pioneered Nepali writing in English in 1950s, Mani Dikhit, Tek Bahadur, Karki, Ovi Subedi, Padma Prashad Dev Kota, D.B. Gurung, Lakmi Devi, Raj Bhandari, and a few other continued to write in English during the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. Arresting God in Kathmandu by Shamrat Upadhyay uh, is another novel. Upadhyay, born and raised in Kathmandu, is the first Nepali author to write in English and be published in the West. Sushma Joshi, Robi Thapa, Pravin Adhikari, they are the contemporary writer. And Pranoy Rana, I should mention the name Pranoy Rana and his City of Dreams. It was published uh, by Rupa in 2015. Pravin Adhikari is the Vanishing Act. It was also published by Rupa in 2014. Robi Thapa's Nothing to Declare, published by Penguin 2011. So what about Wooten? So uh, Kunjang Koden, I don't know whether the pronunciation is correct or wrong, born in 1952, is the first Bhutanese woman to write a novel in English. Circle of Karma, published by Penguin Books India in 2005, is her first novel. Then La Ama, A Mother's Call, another novel by Shador Wangmo. Still, I don't know the pronunciation is correct or not, but I think, I think it should be pronounced in that way. Author has artistically exposed secrets behind the closed door of a Bhutanese society. So, uh, so far I know the Bhutanese uh, tradition of literature is mostly the oral literature. And uh, 
it's uh, the tradition of liter uh, written literature is not more than 50 years. I might be wrong. So now comes the question. Post-independence voices in South Asian writings. What would be the post-independent voices in South Asian writings? Now comes the question, is it really possible to talk of South Asian writing in English as a body of works that can be considered as a whole? The very vital question. I don't know whether all the countries uh, uh, would like uh, to be uttered in the single bracket, just only on the geographical basis. Ashish Nundi, Ashish Nundi, the Indian scholar, looks forward to a South Asian scholarship, not from the point of view of the Western discourse of nationalism. He urges that it should be rediscovered that South Asian societies are woven not around the state, but around their plural cultures and uh, pluricultural identities. Very important, very important point, I think, uh, pluricultural identities. And what is pluricultural identities? Pluriculturalism is, in, uh, is an approach to the self and others as complex, rich beings which act and react from the perspective of multiple identifications. Very, very, very important thing. A man should not be identified as a single identification, the multiple identification. In this case, identity or identities are the byproducts of experiences in different cultures. Ashish Nandi says, uh, Shantan Dashgupto, another uh, a scholar of uh, West Bengal, Calcutta, a professor of comparative literature of Jadavpur University, regrets the eraser of our identity as South Asians that has been affected primarily by the hegemonizing claims of national identity. Very important point. He suggests that national identity has been gained as the expense of communalities and uh, that uh, such identity was consolidated after partition as the cost of millennia old shared history. Dashkupto also shows that like the literatures produced in the vernacular languages, South Asian writers in English have been and are articulating deeply felt views about boundaries, colonialism, communalism, class, caste, freedom, nationalism, partition and race and religion through their works. There is a need for adapting a broader South Asian perspective and for resisting further fragmentation of the psyche of the people of the region that has been caused by partition-induced issues. Dashgupta declares in it that these sorts of partitioning in the cultural sphere can only diminish us. Let us be good South Asians. <laughs> Ultimately, finally, I would like to say South Asian writing in English can only survive as a category because of its ability to represent all South Asians whether in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, or in some other countries of the world, where people from the region have dispersed that it will be South Asian writing in English, including the best works from the vernacular languages translated effectively into the indispensable link language, I mean, the bridge language that can mostly effectively perform the function can hardly be doubted. It is, uh, yes, it's possible if we translate the uh, literature written in vernacular uh, languages, certainly it will get a global exposure and certainly that will be considered uh, as a South Asian uh, uh, literature in English. So thank you very much. Uh, once again for inviting me to tell something 
and uh, giving me the platform to share my views with you and other scholars who talked here and will be talking here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Professor, for uh, uh, beautifully summarizing the various uh, writings in English in South Asia across the across different parts of South Asia. And it was a pleasure to listen to you. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the chat box so far, uh, we don't have any comments. Uh, uh, if if anybody wishes to, yeah, uh, I would ask like to uh, make an observation sure. rather than a question. Uh, yeah, can I go forward? Yes, 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 yeah. please. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the three talks, uh, very uh, scholarly talks, we had three of them in the morning. And uh, my general observation is that uh, normally we, but as one of the speakers have clearly marked, we need a Westerner to tell us that we are good, to compliment that we are writing good, and even we are, I think, uh, as uh, South Asians, we are so dependent on them to get a clean sheet or a kind of a certificate, either on our language or the method of expression or even otherwise. So it is high time that South Asian countries should stand together. They should introduce literature in the subcontinent as a, a part of their academic discourse. You can introduce papers, maybe Sri Lankan literature, Pakistani literature, Afghan literature. Of course, in my college, I, I, I am very proud to say that Ghalid Dosaini is a very popular writer. Right? Before that, uh, no, when I was a student, I never heard of Af Afghan literature. Of course, that was way back in the 90s. Uh, so so what, what my suggestion is that at least South Asian countries, university should introduce papers of our own literature. And uh, luckily in India, we have diverse uh, languages, but uh, there are quite a huge number of translations now being available. All yes. local languages, regional languages are uh, translated to English. So getting a material in English language, which is largely the link language for us, it is easier. So it is high time that we introduce our own literature courses. We design courses and teach our students just like how they made Canadian literature and Latin American literature popular. There should be an attempt from our side because we are the people who have to decide on that. We don't need anybody's certificate to introduce that. Then number two, there should be discourses like this, seminars like this, based on our own culture, our own literature. We have nothing to do with the Western, right? Western has an altogether different culture and Eastern or maybe even within ourselves, we have different cultures, but mutually honor them. Just like you were talking about Bhutan. I'm very sorry that I have not come across any Bhutan literature so far, of course, with my limited knowledge. Uh, what, what I feel is that now Bhutan is a country which has grown up. Of course, India was somehow parenting. I mean, that, that is what I understand from your discourse. India was somehow parenting Bhutan. Now it is Bhutan has come of age. Now it is you are independent, you are matured, you can take your own decision. You don't need not follow what your uh, maybe parental country or maybe something very like true. India. You very need, it's time to establish yourself. And Bhutan should bring up a literature of its own from its local language into English. Only then it comes to the public domain. Maybe as a researcher, as a teacher, I may not be able to access the Bhutanese literature written in the native language. So it is high time that you it should come to the uh, fold with an English translation. So let this particular webinar initiate such a kind of a discussion where we need to establish and maybe initiate a discussion to promote our own culture, our own literature. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your reflection. Um, and also, you know, this kind of reminds us that how much we should be, you know, uh, de stereotype ourselves to understand about South Asia, because as, uh, as the previous question, uh, the person who asked the question uh, already mentioned that he's unaware of uh, Bhutan's uh, rich literary uh, legacy which is actually kind of also shows our, uh, you know, our, our unfortunate attempt to uh, move beyond our stereotypical positionalities and to venture into other literary works as well. So I'm glad that this kind of uh, conferences, events are creating that platform and introducing works to the listeners and the, 
and the readers and the writers and the researchers. So without wasting um, further time, I would like to uh, request Dr. Ra Rajeshree, so please uh, go ahead with your question. Yeah, thank you, Sayan. Um, so thank you for representing Bangladesh in our conference on South Asia. Um, I had uh, a question. This is uh, actually based on my curiosity because of my personal interest in the area. You dwelt quite a bit on partition literature, both from India and from Bangladesh. I was wondering if you have uh, any literature in Bangladesh, which is based upon the partition experience on its Eastern frontier, which is the frontier that it shares with Northeast India. I just wanted to know if you have any literature of this type. Uh, in the Bangladeshi literature tradition? Mm, in Bangladesh literature, uh, in it is in Bangla, not in English. I told you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hassan Azizul Hawk and another writer, uh, in fact, uh, he, he is from Bangladesh to India, Mihir Shen Gupto. Mihir Shen Gupto has a, a novel, Bengali novel, uh, the name, Bengali name is Bishad Brikho. Bishad Brikho, uh, if you, if you uh, translate it into English, it might be the tree of pain, a tree of agony. Tree, tree of agony. In fact, uh, uh, in, in partition, millions of people were uprooted. So uh, from, from their mother motherland, so uh, a lot of writings uh, in Bengali literature uh, I referred to earlier, Swed Walibullah, he was a diplomat. Uh, he wrote Ekti Tulshi Gacher Kahini in Bengali. So Tulshi tree, you know, uh, especially the Hindu community, every, every uh, uh, premises, uh, premises of the house of the Hindu community, there is a Tulshi tree. They, uh, uh, keep it for their worship. So, ekti tulsi gacher ka the story of a tulsi tree. So, it's a very fine uh, novella uh, regarding the partition. Uh, uh, Hassan Azizul Haq wrote uh, Gayotri Shundha. Uh, sorry, uh, um, Shivli Shabitri Upakhan. Uh, Selina Hosan. Selina Hosan wrote Gayotri Shundha. So, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, in Bengali literature, there are many short stories on that issues, but they don't get any global exposure because they are not translated in English. And that is the main cause. Uh, uh, I told you, uh, uh, however, uh, you will take it, uh, I don't know. Uh, it is my book, which was published in England, River, Modumoti and the Broken Fiddle. River Modumoti and the Broken Fiddle. The title uh, is also the title of a story which is on the partition. Which is on the partition. And in this uh, collection, you will get at least three short stories regarding the partition. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, that. Uh, agony of the partition suffered, we suffered from the agony of the partition. Even uh, the exposure uh, in Bengali literature is immense. But uh, as said earlier, as I said earlier, as they are not translated into English, that is why they don't get any global uh, uh, exposure. You, you think uh, Rithik Ghatok, Rithik Ghatok, the filmmaker, the Bengali filmmaker who made several films alone, alone several films on the partition. Mege Dhaka Tara. If you, if you have any chance, certainly, if you watch the film, certainly you will notice the plight of the people who were uprooted from their mother tongue. So in fact, still partition, partition is a major issue, uh, I think in both the countries. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any question? Okay, if you don't have any time, please give my uh, Facebook uh, 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 yeah, identity or my email to them. If they ask me question through email or uh, uh, through messenger, certainly I will answer. 
Yeah, that will be great, sir. Mm. Thank you, thank you so much, respected sir, for your uh, uh, for your kind uh, reflections and such amazing uh, projection of uh, of the South Asian literature once again. And uh, with this, we uh, come to a conclusion of the three uh, plenary lectures that we had today. And it was really uh, so well interconnected and so uh, well established, taking us all across across South Asia from different dimensions, social, cultural, political, literary di dimensions, and also so many new perspectives came to the forefront. So now I would like to sincerely request our, our pro program leader, Dr. S. Chitra, Madam, to uh, propose the vote of thanks and uh, if she has any announcement uh, also for the future sessions she could make. Thank you so much. Sorry, on behalf of YCC and the co-organizer, Dr. Jay Singh, I would like to extend our gratitude to Professor Sharif, first of all, for accepting this invitation and also making uh, this uh, participation from South Asia, your representation of the region from South Asia and the enlightening talk today by connecting so many issues. Uh, we feel honored and thankful, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. We look forward to staying connected with you. Uh, your mail ID and other details are with me. We will stay connected. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll be honored. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, sir. Dear participants, thank you, thank you for uh, making this session wonderful by your participation, by joining this main session today. I have an important announcement to make. Uh, today, the main session comes to an end with this, and I request all the participants to join the paper presentation session and make your presentation in the assigned slots, uh, respective assigned slots without missing the session. If you have already completed your presentation yesterday, please join to motivate other speakers and to interact with them. And the next announcement is, tomorrow we are beginning the session as usual at 9 a.m. Like today, 9 a.m. is the Bhutan time and 8.30 would be the Indian time. Yesterday we missed the keynote address of Professor Betsy, Bel uh, Betsy Bolton and it has been rescheduled for tomorrow. I request you all to kindly join and benefit from that session. It's on a very interesting and an important topic about nationalism, internationalism, and intranationalism in the context of South Asia. Uh, please join and benefit. This is an ad hoc adjustment. Uh, kindly join and benefit. And I will post this message in WhatsApp group also. Please check it and respond. Thank you so much. Let's end the session formally today with this.